What's going on, everybody? Peace, 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 and power and elevation be to all you beautiful folks out there. It's your girl Tiffany come through here live in the fake. Live in the fake. So I wanna uh get on this subject because it's been on my mind for the past week. And um it's something that I didn't even know, and it was brought to my uh attention. So so the information was brought to my attention and uh, I wanted to share with you guys. Okay. So I didn't know about anything about the relationship between the Wolof and the Moors. Um, and also I got some information about Louisiana slave trade, right? So yes, I have some information on the website called WhitneyPlantation.org. So I want to share that. And also, I want to talk about the Gambia and the transatlantic slave trade as well. So, what I want to do is, I just want to make sure before I get started, I want to um, thank you guys that have been subscribed to my channel, sharing my channel, liking my channel, etc. And also, I want to give thanks to the brother HG from Ears to the Street for his interview. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. All right. So, I want to get started on this information. Um, I'm going to have a special guest coming on here. So hopefully I get that person on here. All right. So I have a special guest, a surprising guest at that, that's going to talk with me about this subject matter because we were just building before I got on here. So we had a nice, pretty build. It was a good build. All right. But yes, let me go ahead and get started. So what I want to do is I want to, I got some books I want to share about sending Gambia transatlantic slave trade. But what I want to do is talk a little bit about the Wolof people and then go into sending Gambia's uh, transatlantic slave trade. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the Moors. All right. OK, so. So what I want to do is I want to get into. Who the Wolof people are. All right. Now, many of you guys may not know that. The great Shane Anti Jolt, as we know him as Shane Anti Diop, he was a Wolof, okay, and um, he was a Muslim, so he was also a scientist as well. He did with he dealt with biology, okay, and uh, the yeah from there, you know, they are very closely related to the Fulani people. And I known a couple of people that were Fulani and um, Wolofs. Okay, I have worked with a couple of people that was from the region. And oftentimes I get told that <laughs> by the African themselves that come from these places that I look like I'm Fulani. <laughs> I get told that I look like a Fulani person. I'm like, well, I don't know. I might have some Fulani in me. But the truth of the matter is, nine times out of ten, more than likely we do have Fulani because. Uh, during the beginning of the slave trade, a lot of our ancestors came from Senegambia area. And then they, later on, they came from Nigeria. But in the beginning, it was mostly Senegambia. All right. And it was also then the Congo and Angola area. But yeah, a lot of us have that because they were one of the first people to get involved in the slave trade. So let me go ahead and share this information about the Wolof. Okay, let's get into who the Wolof people are. So as we can see, the Wolof people are a West African ethnic group found in Northwestern Senegal, the Gambia and Southwestern coastal Mauritania. So in Senegal, the Wolof are the largest ethnic group while elsewhere they are a minority. They refer to themselves as Wolof and speak the Wolof language in the West Atlantic branch of the Niger Congo family of languages, right? Then it goes down to talk about their early history is unclear. The earliest document mention of the Wolof is found in the records of the 15th century. Portuguese finance Italian traveler Alvaz Candamasto, who mentioned well established Islamic Wolof chiefs advised by Muslim counselors. The Wolof belonged to the medieval era Wolof empire of the Senegambia region. So check this out. It says detail of the pre-Islamic religious 
tradition of the Wolof are unknown and their oral tradition state them to have been adherents of Islam since the founding of King of Jalof or Wolof. However, historical evidence left by Islamic scholar and European travelers suggests that Wolof warriors and rulers did not initially convert to Islam, although accepting and relying on Muslim clerics as counselors and administrators. So in and after the 18th century, the Wolofs were impacted by the violent jihad in West Africa, which triggered into internal disagreements about Islam among the Wolofs. So in the 19th century, as the colonial French forces launched a war against the Wolof kingdoms, the Wolof people resisted the French and converted to Islam. So contemporary Wolofs are predominantly Sufi Muslims belonging to the Mordida and the Tajania Islamic brotherhoods. All right. So Wolof people like other West African ethnic groups historically maintain a rigid endogamous social stratification that included nobility, clerics, caste, and slaves. The Wolof were close to the French colonial rulers, became integrated into the colonial administration, and have dominated the culture and economy of, the, of Senegal since the country's independence. All right, so we could also go down about its history, about the empire, right? So let's go down to where they talk about slavery. Well, let's go, well, yeah, let's go down to the concept about slavery. Then I got some more information. So slavery had been a part of the Wolof culture since their earlier recorded history prior to the arrival of Europeans to the region inhabited by the Wolof slaves. There were either born to slavery or enslaved via purchase or capture in warfare. Beginning in the 16th century, Portuguese slave traders started to purchase slaves from Senegambian ports to transport their American colonies. There, I mean, these slaves frequently passed through Wolof lands before arriving at the coast as the European demand for slave during increase, right, increase during the 17th and 18th century. The era saw a corresponding increase in Wolof slaves with the purpose of acquiring captives to transport the coast. All right, so that's that information. Hey, peace, peace to my brother. Shout out to you. All right, so let me uh, share another information. Okay, because I want to share some information here. Now let's look into the Wolof Empire. Let's look into the Wolof Empire. <laughs> All right, so so go up to here. It says the Wolof Empire was a state on the west coast of Africa, located between the Senegal and Gambia rivers, which thrived from the mid 14th to the mid 16th century. The empire prospered on trade thanks to two rivers providing access to the resource of African interior and coastal traffic commerce, which includes gold, hides, ivory, and slaves, and which was often carried out with European merchants, notably the Portuguese, then the French. Following the breakup of the Wolof Empire in the 16th century, a smaller state persisted, the Wolof Kingdom, into the 19th century CE. The Wolof language is still widely spoken today in Senegal, Gambia, and Mauritania. And it goes on to say that the Wolof as a people inhabited from the first millennium BCE, the area between Senegal River in the north and the Gambia River in the south. This West African region is often called Senegambia and covers what is today Senegambia, Senegal, Gambia, and Southern Mauritania. Language and pottery both suggest that the ancestor of the Wolof had originally migrated here from Central or Eastern Africa. They fish, grew wet rice, and herd cattle, sheep, and goats, and later pigs. They used iron for tools, pottery, and jewelry. The people of this area of West Africa also set up megalithic monuments and burial markers. Circles were formed some eight meters in diameters using stones up to 
four meters in height. Okay. So it goes on to say the Wolof eventually became the most powerful tribe south of the Senegal River. This territory had once been under the nominal control of the Mali Empire after a successful campaign of expansion by Tara Mangan, a general of Sunjeda Kita, the Mali king. So it talks about the relationship between the two states is unclear, but the Wolof seem to have at least acknowledge the Mali kings as the main West African power. So Wolof's independence can be seen in success for, of their first king or Bubra, the semi-legendary uh, in Indadinde in 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 traditionally placed in the 13th century CE, but more likely to have been in the second half of the 14th century CE. In any case, war, civil wars, attacks from tribes such as the Mazi people and the shift of lucrative trade routes meant that the Mali kings slowly lost their grip on the outer regions of their empire. Around 1468, King Sunni Ali of Sunga Empire then conquered the rump of the Ali Mali Empire. All right, so this is how it looked during the medieval time period. All right, so this is the map during the medieval time period. Let me uh let me show you guys the picture. Peace, 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 everybody. Okay, so my dear friend is on here, and we're going to have this discussion. So I'm going to let him do the talking, okay? Hey, what's going on? It's been a minute. What's up? Assalamu alaikum. What's up, sir? Peace and love. Assalamu alaikum. I'm about to How you doing? Alhamdulillah. Everything's well, mashallah. Everything good. What's happening with you? Oh, everything's going well, mashallah, mashallah. So <laughs> I was just getting into it about the uh, Senegambia's uh, transatlantic slave trade. I was just reading an article from the worldhistory.org. So I just want to show them something real quick and then I'm going to uh, go ahead and let you build on it. Um, I just want to show, you know, how the map was in the er early history during the medieval time period. So let me just go ahead and uh, post it up. You, All right. So hopefully you guys can see that. All right. So this is how the map was looking during the time of the medieval period. Um, so this is the ancient map, as you can see. Let me kind of zoom this up. So this is the amp. Ooh, this is the empire. So it's the ancient medieval sub-Saharan African states. So you got the Sun God Empire, and you got the Wolof Empire, then you got the Ghana Empire, Mali, okay, Kingdom of Ife, the Kingdom of Benin, the Kingdom of of Congo, just to show you guys a little something. Um, not just gonna go too much into it, but this is how the king it was broken down into kingdoms before it became what it is today. So each um empire, so each um country had its own kingdom. So again, you had the Sun God Empire, the Wolof Empire, the Ghana Empire. So I just wanted to show you guys that. All right, and you can find this on um ancient history encyclopedia website, okay. So you can find this information. So brother and goes, you go ahead and uh build. All right, I just wanted to show that to the people. So you yeah, go ahead and build. Yeah, that, that's real important. Um, but you show how you know we did have kingdoms. A lot of the new borders that we have um for the continent of Africa is, is really new. But at one time we we it, it was based off kingdoms, and you had a lot of beef and, and things going on. Um, I'm glad you're having the show on um on on on, on Africans and the more and the Norse and the Moors or the Nor Norse at that time and different and the Wolof and the Wolof and the Fulani and the Mandinka and, and the Malinke and the Sanak and the Sanuke people. I think it's very important for us to understand that history, especially from our Western Sudanic ancestors that were stripped, um, to explain what's what. Um, when you really get to the core of it, even though like I was just telling you earlier, you know, Noble Jali. Um, it's still our ancestor to us because he was a predecessor in our uh, movement as a people trying to find themselves. A lot of things he said was exaggerated and a lot will be classified as pseudo today. But if you get the major point of what he was doing, you can see 
why we are at the point that we are in. So when you start explaining this and showing this, you can see the, co the coalition between um, why he identified as a Moorish American. Even if you talk about the Moorish peace treaty with the United States that happened in 1776 or 1777 at the time, we know America itself is probably, what, 231 years old because it was established in 1776 at the same time during when you start to find a peace treaty. I might be a year off or whatever. People can look up the Moroccan American treat peace treaty. But either way, um, the ancestors, when he talked about places like Northwest and Southwest and Maxim, that Morocco portion of Africa is very important because even though we are not those, we were not those people directly, most of those people were Amazigh or Berber, as they say, uh, the Rifians and those different groups of people, it still was a zeal and an important place of Africa in the sense of victory that did some powerful stuff, especially when, um, not to embrace people colonizing people, like when they conquered Spain in 711 AD through General Tariq, who was working for the Arabs, when the Arabs took over the, those portions of North Africa. Uh, North Africa before going up there, but it's still an important zeal to show African independence, African greatness, African movement, even though they were not us directly, those people are Amazigh and Berber, but it's also um, important to understand the Almavet Empire. Um, which stretches from south southern Morocco after 711 AD in the 13th century, if I'm not mistaken, late 12th or 13th century, and the Almavads, when they started to pick up from people from southern Morocco, southern, um, southern Algeria, northern Senegal, and those portions of Africa, when you start to see the via black population that was recruited in the military or studying a black sultan who they classified uh, who was part um, Amazigh and his mother was a black African woman. Um, either way, it's very important to understand Muslim history in Africa and what happened and the greatness of what occurred in North Africa with our Berber or Amazigh cousins that put in a lot of work and the element of it that comes from the black Africans who played a major role when studying, you know, um, Massa Musa, uh, the Sanake, uh, Songhai and those different groups, the Wolof, the, uh, the Nars, the, the Sidir and those different groups, you know, and even the Fulani before the raid, you know, that, that, that black element. And the work that we put in dealing with Islam. You know. Okay, so now let's look at all right the relationship between the Wolofs and the Moors, right? And how that played the part. Because um, as I was telling you earlier, when I looked up the information about the Wolofs, right, that they were one of the uh, biggest slave traders, or, or were well, not the biggest slave trade. They was the they was very prominent in the slave trade during that time period, in um, in Senegambia. You know, what I'm saying when they encountered the Portuguese. So let's just like build from there, like um, you know, the relationship between the Wolofs and the Moors, and how that uh, uh, you know, played the part into the Senegambia transatlantic slave trade. Let's go. There was a lot of beef going on. The, the Wolof was giving up a lot of Mandinka people at that time. So, you know, that's why a lot of the African Americans have a lot of Mandinka ancestry, but a lot of Wolof was sold too. Oh, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, so they were selling each other. So that's definitely um, important. You know, we got to think a lot of these black Africans had ties with a lot of the Amazigh or Berbers, you know, and selling people or conquering other people was business. We can't act like it wasn't. You know what I'm saying? Right, so right, right. It was a lot of stuff going on. So you had certain villages who certain villages didn't fuck with and they wanted to get rid of them. So it was part of the marketing scheme that was going on at that time. I mean, it's sad because we are a result of that, but it happened. So yes, the uh, Wolof played a major role. Even Mandinka, they played a lot of these people played a major role in um and um the transatlantic slave trade. But a lot of them were sold, you know, sold afterwards themselves. So, so it basically would be safe to say that not only we are a descendant of those who were enslaved, but also a descendant of those who were slave traders. Correct? Absolutely. Because here's the thing: the people that were sold into slavery shared the same genetic signatures as the people that were selling them. They the same people. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, people may look at it like it's a caste thing, but no, biologically, these people were the same people. I mean, even though we're all the same people as a human species, but I'm saying if a Wolof was sold later, he shared the same DNA as the Wolof that was selling people. Very close. So absolutely, we are the, 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 the people that were kidnapped and put into slavery, and we were the people that were giving these people away. We, thought we are the same. We are the same, absolutely. Yep. So, um, so here's the article right here, right? Uh, which is Whitney Plantation dot org. Now, Whitney Plantation is located in Louisiana, and um, so here's some of the information that I was uh sharing with Brother Ngozi earlier that I want to share with you guys. 
So right down here where it says Louisiana slave trade, the slaves imported in Louisiana mostly shipped from the harbor of three major regions of the coast of Africa, Senegambia, the Bight of Benin, and West Central Africa. The majority of the slaves force came from Senegambia throughout the colonial period, right? So and, um, going down here, it says that Senegambia is part of the tropical zone, wide open to the Atlantic Ocean between the Sahara Desert and the tropical forest of Guinea. All right. And it talks about Sen Senegal and the Gambia are the main rivers through which people from the interior, like the Bambara and the Mandingo, were sold as slaves. As you mentioned, Brother Ngozi, um, the Gambia River is the main route of penetration into the hinterland and divides the region into two parts, northern Senegambia, southern Senegambia. Northern Senegambia was the site of many political construction based on hierarchical society. Millet was the principal food crop and Islam became the principal religion without erasing the traditional practices. The main ethnic groups are the Wolof, the, the Falupe, the Seir, and the Moors up to 1742. The trade of Senegal was a monopoly of the French Company of the West Indies, which had its headquarters in St. Louis or St. Louis at the mouth of the Senegal River. Gore Island was the principal entrepot where both merchandise and slaves were stored before being shipped away. All right. So now let's go down to where it says. Um, so, yeah, let's go down to where it says the trade of the, uh, the Gambia River was under the control of the British who constantly competed with competed with the French. The um, yeah, the Barbara and the Mandingo were among the most fluent et ethnicity on Louisiana plantation. They contribute very deep cultural influence to the culture of Louisiana, including masking, which eventually led to the resilient tradition of the Mardi Gras Indians of, the, of New Orleans. So the Wolof, the Moors, and the Falupe were respectively designed as Senegal, Nard, and Pullard. Nard is the Wolof name for the Moors. The Falupe of Futa Toro called themselves Hal Polar. The Senegal and Pullard have been retained as family names in Southwest Louisiana. So the bulky and limping folk tales of Louisiana originate in Senegambia. And it says these tales also survive in Haiti, in Florida, and the Bahamas. Buki is the Wolof name for hyena. His name came with the enslaved Africans and one can still recognize him under the disguise of a wild coyote along with Buzz Bunny, the Warner Brother redemption of Compire Lapin, aka Bear Rabbit. So now before I go any further, uh brother, would you like to build on that? Oh you can go in further. Give me one second and get him ready. Run second. Okay. okay then okay then cool cool cool. All right. So so yeah, while the brother getting ready, somebody put same day as the July 1776 ban of British on the Gambia rip, River. So, and that's funny that you brought that up, sis, because a lot of people don't know that slavery actually ended around that time period. Technically speaking, that's when slavery had ended. But, you know, there was still more people going into, you know, the African continent and bringing more people over here to America illegally. So what I'm saying is that we not only a byproduct of those who were enslaved the first time when slavery was uh, in law and it was uh, practical, right? And it was, you know, saying it wasn't considered as illegal, but we also a byproduct of those who came through illegal slavery. So there, there's two different things going on. You know, you got the slavery that was legal and you got the slavery that was illegal. All right. And that was after 1776. Right. When slavery became illegal and people were still practicing all the way up until the uh, Reconstruction era period. But, um, yeah, go ahead, brother. And go. So what you want to. Oh, ab 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 absolutely. That's what I'm saying. It, all of this is very important to explain, you know, uh, our history with uh with slavery and i'm glad that this is actually a beautiful show when you explain what you explain with the west africans directly our direct ancestors um and all of this they did have an underground slave trade they even had one e even after 1865 when they imported a lot of um nigerians that was underground that people don't speak of 
you know, a lot of the Yoruba who were being snatched. Mm -hmm. the, Yoruba played, the Yoruba played a major role in the uh, slavery at first, but then later, especially when the houses, houses start to dominate in the North, a lot of those people were sold in the underground and people don't speak about that after 1865. So it was a few people that were still being imported over here. You could type up underground slavery that was still occur occurring, especially being dropped off through the Caribbean and through the Caribbean, yeah. and having ties with people going, you know, a few drifters going into the, into the North. So it's very important for us to understand the full context of what was going on with this thing called slavery and the marketing that was going on at the time. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's really messed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is really important. And then um, I also want to share something too from this article as well. Right. So it says the political unrest and natural con contingency such as drought pushed many people towards southern Senegambia. This region comprised the area reaching from the Gambia River in the north down to the forest of Guinea in the south. All along the coastal side the, from Casamasi to Sierra Leone, a mire of streams colonized by thick mangrove swamps pour into the Atlantic Ocean. This region called, and I'm not good at uh, speaking French, so I'm not going to try to pronounce that in French, but anyway, it says, basically it's called the Southern Rivers by French sailors or Rio de Guinea by the Spanish, and the Portuguese became a refuge for people such as the Jola, Balanta, Banun, uh, Menja, Mencon, Papel, Baga, Nalu, Landume, uh, Susu, Timne, Kisi, and Toma, etc. So through the centuries, they established a egalitarian society where life was centered on villages. Rice was and still is their principal staple crop. Moving eastward from the coast, the mangrove swamp transitioned into vegetation covered composed of a mixture of savanna-like grasses and rainforests. In this area, the Felupe and Mandigo migrants create respectively the kingdoms of Futa, Jalon, and Kabu, which became strong slaving powers. So southern Senegambia contributes 10% of the total volume of the transatlantic slave trade with the birth and the backing of the theocratic state of Futa, Jalon, where Islam provided an ideological justification for the enslavement of pagans. So the Felupe of Futa Jalon were also the victims of this chaotic situation. The most famous among them was Abdul Rahman Berri, a son of Ibrahim Sore, king of Futa Jalon. In 1788, he was captured during warfare against the neighboring Mandingo kingdom of Kabu and sold to the coast. He was then taken to the Caribbean islands of Dominica and from there to New Orleans where he was sold to Thomas Foster, a planter established in Natchez, Mississippi. He spent 40 years in bondage in this city where he was referred to as Prince. The captain sold from the Southern Rivers played a very important role in the development of rice cultivation in the U.S., nobly South Carolina, and Louisiana. So in its instruction for, uh, was it, Sir, I, I guess that's Sir Harpin, yeah, Sir Harpin, Cap Captain of Learvore, or Learvore, Learvore, or I, like I said, I'm not good with French, so forgive me. But anyways, uh, the first slave ship sent to Louisiana from the African coast, July the 4th of 1718, the French company of the West Indies included the obligation to acquire rice and slaves who knew how to cultivate it. Somewhere between Cape Mount and Cape Masoret, Senegambia provided the majority of the slaves imported into Americas from the 15th century through the 17th century. This region still as as explored large numbers of slaves during the 18th and 19th century, but never on the same scale as other regions of Africa, such as Bight of Benin or Central Africa. So now with that being said, okay, let's look at, all right. And I want you to know what that empire is. The, the When you talk about the food, uh, food that, those, those were Fulani. So a lot of Fulani people were enslaved. It was, it wasn't just the prince. A lot of Fulani people were enslaved. Mm -hmm. and actually, when you go to Wiki, um, you can type up Fulani Americans and you can see what's going on. There's actually citations on there and real articles. So you actually have a lot of Fulani people that were enslaved. And a lot of African Americans right. are Fulani. You know, as they a are. Thing, I'm glad you brought that up because I have a book 
Um, just give me one second, real quick. Just give me one second, real quick, real fast. Okay. 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 Real fast. So while you're getting your book, yeah, a lot of Fulani were enslaved, and a lot of African Americans are Fulani. African Americans or African North American Creole people are not homogenous. We are not a monolith. We come from multiple ethnic groups from Western Central Africa. You had Mandinka people that were taken. You had Wolof people that was taken. You had Fulani people that was taken. So it's not far fetched for a African North American Creole person as a whole, not just a direct Louisiana Creole, whether you're mm -hmm. a Tidewater Mississippi Creole, mm -hmm. whether you're a Gullah Geechee Creole or a Louisiana surface Creole that you see that's obvious, the one that would mix with French or just all of us as a whole, which represent the Creolization from a hybrid cultural society and our dialects are AABE, African American Vernacular English or Ebonic, which form mm -hmm. from pigeon, pigeon languages. And we even have subsets even within that thing, the Creolization of us. It's very important for us to embrace the, the, the combination of what we come from as Western Central Africans. So if you have an African American that wants to embrace Yoruba, Igbo culture, Fulani culture, Mandinka culture, you can do that. You can even repatriate back into these ethnic groups back home because they allow you to and still be able to consider well, you yourself. You know what? And that's funny that you brought that up. I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, there's some people that I know that's on my page that are part of the Timine tribe, the Timine. You got to un unmute yourself. I can't hear you. One of, one of those brothers are my cousin. The Timine, right? Yeah. One, one of my brothers, one of those brothers that did that is my cousin through my father's side. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, the one that he always go backwards and forward. Um, he was in Carolina. And, you know, again, a lot of my father's side of the family coming through Carolina, I uh, have ties to the Gullah Geechee. And he's actually uh, part of that. So, yes, that the brother um, that you speak of, uh, up down there. Matter of fact, my brother Malik knows him very well. Wallahi. But yeah. Oh. All right. So this is the book that I have about the prince. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, story by Ibrahim Sore. All right. So who was called the prince amongst the slaves. So what people don't know about him, and I did a video about him in the past. Um, as a matter of fact, I had somebody who reached out to me that was a, a descendant of his, a, a descendant relative that right now they stay in I think they live in the Ivory Coast or Guinea, one of those countries. And they reached out to me because they saw my video. All right. So, um, yeah, what people don't know that he was a slave trader. OK, he was a prince and his father was running the kingdom of. Um, was it Futa Jalan? Right. So his father was running the kingdom. And when his dad was running the kingdom, right, he was responsible, you know, making sure that he transports slaves to the uh you know to the europeans and whatnot and technically speaking now he wasn't he wasn't even supposed to be enslaved <laughs> that's the part that that's the crazy part about it. he wasn't supposed to be enslaved however they went on here they didn't care at that time you know them europeans they let me show you how the europeans so clever so the europeans were so clever to where they pretty much they turned on those africans over there so those african is what we call get god they don't get they done get god they done got got by the europeans basically they ain't got got by the europeans so that's why you see today that <laughs> that's why you see today it's colonized a lot of those countries are colonized because the europeans found a clever way of doing it so why the africans thought that they were doing business with the europeans you know just trading off and get whatever resources they wanted at the same time the europeans had in mind that nah we want more than that. We want to take over. We want to take over what you got. We want to take over your land. We want to take over resources because Africa is the richest continent in the world. It's the richest continent in the world. And a lot of countries and a lot of continents rely on Africa for the natural resource. Okay. So by Africa being the richest continent, right? And it has so many natural resources. We talking about gold. We talking about coal mine. We talking about the food. We talking about whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever is needed, a lot of times they go to Africa. And that's where the money is at. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Africa is like at the world marketing. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> the world market. So it's like it's up for marketing. It's like up for sale kind of, but not really. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, they, these people end up getting taken advantage of by these Europeans. Because they didn't think that the European goal was to do that. That's why certain people were trying to give our warning. And I'm going to uh, bring this. I, I like bring her up. Her name is. Um, 
she's from the Congo, right? She started the Anatonian movement. Okay, her name is um Don Kimpa Vita, Don Kimpa Vita, right? Who was the uh founder of the Antonian, which is like the African version of the uh, Roman Catholicism, okay? Because at that time the Portuguese was over there, the uh Congo and Angolia region, when you know, way before she was born, and so she was trying to let Pedro the fifth know that hey, we cannot trust these people, the Portuguese, they up to something. She was trying to let him know, and he wasn't trying to hear what she got to say. And here it is, a young woman trying to tell this man, like, look, man, these Portuguese is up to something. We got to do something about these folks. So she started the Antonian movement to, like, uh, bring about the revolution and rebel against the Portuguese. And so, <laughs> but at the end, she ended up getting executed because... She didn't follow the guidelines, the principle of the Catholic religion. So she, you know, she ended up getting executed or whatnot. She was like 21 or 22. But yet, yeah, Don Kipa Vita was like a very revolutionary. So she was one of the people to let them know what was going on. You know what I'm saying? And also, we talk about, and, and I'm going to bring up another one, and it's kind of off the subject. So we also talk about Queen Nzinga. You know, like Queen Nzinga, yes, she played a part in the slave trade. But we have to look at the time period. She was caught up in the middle of it. It was like she had no choice. It's just like if you was raised in the mafia family, right? And somebody or in a crime organization family, period. And someone passes away and you're the next in line. You have to take over whatever the organization is. You have to, you know, do. You can't just basically say, well, I don't want no part of that. I I, I don't. I reject that. Don't get. Don't put me into that picture. You can't do that. Because at the end of the day, you still got to do something because your family is at war with the other crime mobs out there. So you got to do something. Right. So that's kind of like in her situation. She had to do something because they was at war at the time with the Portuguese. And the Portuguese was like one of the first Europeans to go over there to Africa to pretty much uh, pick up slaves. They was one of the first to do it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and then. The, and then uh, later on, the British came along, the French, the Dutch, you know what I mean? The Belgian people, they came along and started falling afterwards. But it was the Portuguese and the Spanish people that was one of the first to go over there because they saw that, hey, this is where we can make our money at. We got colonies. We want to get some people to co come over here and work for us and, you know what I mean, and they help build up our land. So basically to say this, to say all that, Slavery exists because of the economic system. Slavery exists because of what we call capitalism. Okay. So without the concept of capitalism, do you think the idea of slavery will ever exist? No, it will never exist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's but that's the reason why I see slavery is what built up capitalism. You know what I mean? So that's why so many people of today, especially our people, you know, here in America. We try to fight for the concept of reparation. We try to fight for that because it's like, hey, this is our do. We owe this. You know what I mean? You promised us 40 acres in a mules. We didn't get that. <laughs> and you, you promised us this day and other. But then, but the reality is, let's be honest, it may not happen in our lifetime. That's the that's the sad reality. No matter how much fight we try to put up for it, it's not going to really happen. The concept of reparation, we're not going to really get that. And it's something, and then what people have to understand, slavery was not a United States business. It was an international business. It was a business amongst Africa and uh, the European nations and North America. Okay? So not just North America, South America, Latin America, Caribbean. It was, it was an international business. So it's like everybody, all parties is involved in this. Okay? So it's not just one particular group of people that's involved, you know what I'm saying? Everybody was involved in this, but, um, but yeah, that's something that we have to really understand. It's like the concept about slavery is very complex. The history about slavery is so complex and it's a lot that goes into it. And then, and then before we get to the concept about transatlantic slave trade, people got to know about the trans saharian slave trade. That's something that Africa was dealing with before they even encountered the transatlantic slave trade, especially you talking about West Africa, those over there in Senegal and up in that area, the Mali area, they they experienced that. So it's like they experienced multiple, uh, um, what is it, multiple trauma of both 
not only the trans saharian but from the transatlantic so it's like double trauma there because you you dealing with slavery all over again it's like it's a continuation it's something that just never ended and there's some nations in africa that just got out of slavery there's some nation in africa that just got out of slavery like we talking about no more than maybe 50 60 years ago like it, 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 that that's just how like people just don't really understand the effects of it you know what i mean so but um yeah i'm gonna go ahead so brother what, what you want to say in goes i'm gonna let you i i can't hear you uh no I, I i have nothing to say i think you broke it down bro like you you went in sister like um, yeah. I, I feel that was powerful uh you explained our history that we need to fully understand as western central african people i want you to look up mm -hmm. in the future Fulani oh let me uh, show this comment real fast so a brother on here said i am in ken in wandu and the other side of my family is takara fulani of northern cameroon mashallah mashallah yeah so what was you saying, Ngozi? I want you to look up uh, Fulani Americans, um, and, oh. and when you get a chance, um, Fulani and, Americans. Let's look yeah. that up right now. I never heard about the Fulani Americans. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of it's a it's a movement for populations of groups that know. Let's look up Fulani Americans. See, look it up now. Read oh, it. <laughs> wow! Wait a minute. Wow! That's interesting. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That's interesting. Let's share this with the people. See, you know, because I know about the what well, I wouldn't say. Um, I think the Igbo Americans. Yeah, Igbo Americans, Fulani yeah. Americans, and it's maybe the Khan people. Yes, and, and my whole thing, sis, is to let the African Americans know, or African North American Creole people know, that you have ethnicities outside of just being the position called black in North America. That's the position. You have ethnicity, just like other people do. You have ethnicity. You can even repatriate back into these ethnicities. It's not far off. And as African Americans, select your branch that you feel that you're most closer to from those portions of people that were stripped, because you are those people, and we should not have a um, right a, see, a, see. A, a, a guard up against our people from the continent because exactly. we all live together, you know. Exactly. See what it says: Fulani American, Fulani American. The first Fulani people were forcibly as as. Appetrated to United States from the slave trade came from several parts of West and Central Africa. Many Falupe came places as Guinea, Senegal, Guinea Basu, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and Cameroon. So most of the people who came from Senegal belonged to the ethnic groups Mandinka and Fula. Recent Fulani arrivals immigrant immigrated to the United States during the 1990s. 90s and now make up a significant portion of the Muslim community across America. That's interesting. But people don't understand. It's just not that. Even with the even with studying roots, um, um, even though some stuff inside of roots was exaggerated, but um Kuta Kinte was Mandinka. He was Mandinka. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yo, like get back in tune with this. You know, we have a bridge in Gambia and Guinea. One of my cousins that you brought up is two of them. One is from Indiana, the other one's from Carolina. He's connected think, back in Kenne. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the one you're talking about, I think I'm familiar with the one you're talking about from Indiana. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the one who connected back with the Timne. The other brother who's related to me connected with the Mende people. And they and, and, and he got a full life over there. Dual citizenship. This shit is for real. This is not a joke. This is right. not a joke. And people exactly. running around here, people running around here playing. No, no, no. You have people that's really on the ground just trying to ignite, or not trying, or igniting back with the continent, back with home. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And one thing about this character called Ngozi, and Ngozi has many meanings. And Igbo, it's unisex. It can mean blessing. Mm -hmm. And Zulu, it can mean danger. And Swahili, mm -hmm. it can mean skin. But what I'm trying to tell you is outside of that, I take Africa very serious. Wallahi. And it's not, right. because, you know, it's, this is not a joke. So what I'm saying is, is that you have people that's on the ground that's connecting back. It's just not with the Fulani. It's also with uh, some African Americans embracing the Yoruba culture and ethnicity. They're, oh, they're yeah. connecting back with it. This shit not a game. Practice and yeah, and just like you know, back in October, um, you know, it was Hoodoo Month. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm saying Hoodoo, um, is consists of basically the uh mixture of African traditional practice from the Congo, the Yoruba, like you said. You know, Mandingo, all of that mixed in together with American practices. You know what I mean? So 
And a lot when and I always tell people this, I always say this. Like when you go to church, right? <laughs> if you go to church, you will see a lot of African practices in the churches. So when people have holy goals and doing the praise dancing and speaking in the tongues and all of that, that's African practices. And then I was doing the one video about invisible church. So um, with uh, the, the first Africans, they didn't have a, a church building like we know of today. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? They church was the plantation, the, you know, when the slave master wasn't looking, they would go to the plantation. They would, you know, uh, have church or they'll go to the woods. And they congregate in a circle mm -hmm. and have their fellowship there. You know what I'm saying? And also, uh, then later on, they had a praise house. So a praise house is like a small little, you know, a small little home. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? They'll go into the praise house and they have worship. And then what they'll do is they'll just, the people who shall preach, you know, as far as the pastor is concerned. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so people don't realize that, you know, when you talk down on about, African tradition, African culture, there will be no black culture without African, you know what I'm no. saying? Because it's what that's what made black culture, you know what I'm saying? Because one of the first people to be called black was the Africans that were brought here to America, they were the first people to be identified as black. Um, so the sister said, oh. I visited the village of Kunta Kinte and is from the met his eighth generation family members. That's a blessing, mashallah. And here's the thing, you know, when it comes to like, for me, as 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 African North American Creole person, my mother's Fulani. Mm -hmm. My mother was born. She, my, my mother background family came through Mauritania and Guinea. Some of them had ties to um, Algeria. I'm like five, only five. To, first, it was six percent, but I'm like five to four percent um, classified as North African. Some mm -hmm. sometimes it drops lower, but my Senegambian DNA portion is very high because of her. But my father is African North American Creole who has history here. I have four sets of ethnic groups that I come from based off the signatures that's been seen. Fulani, Mandinka, Yoruba, and Bimelike. Those represent the, 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 the portions that makes up for me fully. When it comes to the non-African components, small segments of North African, you find Jewish in me a larger chunk, Irish, not a lot of Northwestern European, but most African American, but not a lot of British, I meant to say, mostly Irish component and Mediterranean from Italy. You find those components. So what I'm saying is, is that when you start um, following the creolization of what happened to us, uh, from, I, I speak from both sides of my family. I fully embrace my West African, my land or uh, culture. And, and, and what I mean by Mali is Mali just doesn't stretch from the capital of Mali today. My least stretches from Guinea, Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and even some points of Senegal. All of that was part of Mali. The culture that I repatriated back into, even though I embraced, you know, my mother Pula or Fulani side, you guys hear me say it all the time. Everybody that know me, especially that's part of um, the street Sufis, know that we embrace Mandinka. That's what we repatriated back into the Mandinka culture and identity. We take it serious. Even my cousin know that shit. We takes it serious. The cousin that you spoke of who connected back with Timnay. People don't follow this character and goes enough to try to explain. I mean, understand what the hell is going on. It, there's a plan and mission for what we got going on with what's what's being said. So I want the world to understand people on the ground for real. They are. Oh, yeah, most definitely. And, you know, there's been a lot of criticism about folks um, going to Africa and, uh, you know, visiting, like, especially when they had the whole of uh, uh, the, 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 the time of return or something like that, where folks was going to Ghana and they was visiting the area where the slaves were, um, you know, it was like a palace or a, a, a house where the slaves was uh, transported to you know, before they got on the slave ship, like there was criticism from those here saying that why, why is people going over there to Africa? Why are they going to Ghana? Why are they going to Nigeria? Those people don't claim us. They don't deal with us. This, they, and other, they don't like us. Okay. Well, Go ahead. I was going to say, well, we don't, well, that, that goes for the niggas on 63rd. They don't like the niggas on 64th. Right. Uh, that's uh, going for the uh, east side and the west side. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, like people don't like each other. Who cares? Yes, you're going to have some people that give you pushback back home, but you got people that give you pushback here. Who gives a fuck? It, it's not, a, see, a person on the continent don't define what's an African. 
You can take the African out of Africa, but you can't take Africa out the African, regardless. Right. So no one gives a fuck about what some angry person says on a continent who really don't give a fuck about his his probably his continent himself. So so and that's not a disrespect to the brothers and sisters back home. What I'm trying to say is, is that they are no less African than you, and you are no less African than them. The only it's thing right. is, is that you've been moved around. You know what I'm saying? African is not defined by a nigga that's still on the continent because you got a bunch of house niggas on the continent. Okay. Yeah, you know so 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 just because a nigga don't like you over there. You got niggas that don't like you here. You know what I'm saying? Who gets mad at you? I mean, I mean, you got people, if you got the original beautiful features, we make fun of that and look down on it because it's original. You know what I'm saying? Because of what happened. So, so who gives a fuck who likes you and who don't? See, in life, whether you're doing right or wrong, someone is always gonna have any something to say. Who cares? There you go. There you go. That's right. There you go. There you go. So um, I'm showing you guys this book. All right. Um, this book is called. This book is written by Bubakar Berry. Tiffany, I, Tiffany, let me just say this before you read, sis. I have to go. I remember what I was doing earlier. I appreciate mm -hmm. you and I, and, I, and, I, and I thank you, sister, and love to you for allowing me to come on. If you're still here in the next 15 minutes, I will be back with Lahi. Okay. Um, but um, I thank you for allowing me to come on. I have to take care of something, but thank you, sir. Okay, then. Okay, then. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. alaikum, sister. Hey, that's well, a good deal. Like, like you went in, queen. <laughs> <laughs> well, like a salam. All right, then. Hopefully, I hear from you. Yep, yep. Peace. All right. Peace. All right. So, yeah, that was a beautiful bill from Brother Ngozi. Shout out to Ngozi, uh, one of my uh, favorite people to talk to. So, I hope you guys enjoy that. So, um, yeah. And he pretty much touched in on a lot of things that we need to know, like a lot of stuff that's very important. He really have touched in on a lot of stuff. And and the reason why I'm sharing this, this is why I'm so passionate about this, because we just don't really know, like, we come from a rich history. We come from a history of those who've been through so much. You know what I'm saying? We don't really know that. It's like, like, when you start learning about so many things, you'll just be like, wow. Like, did we really come from these people? Yes, we did. We come from a rich history of people. You know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, there are some people that did uh, horrifying things that played their part in that. And then there was those who who didn't, you know what I'm saying, who was innocent. Um, it's a lot of stuff that goes on. Like I said, it's a lot that we don't know about slavery. We think we know, but we really don't know. You know what I'm saying? And we probably only know about 10% of it. You know what I mean? So just only 10%. There's more to it. There's so much more to the information. You know what I mean? So uh, I want to share you guys this book real quick. Okay. This book is written by uh, Bubu, Babu, excuse me, Bubakar, Bubakar Berry. So it's called Senegambia and the Atlantic Slave Trade. Okay. So in this book, let's see. Let me kind of zoom out just a little bit. All right. So in this book, well, this is chapter two. I'm, I'm going to go down to chapter three because I want to show you guys something. But it's a lot of information here. There's, there's a lot of jewels in this book. They just break down in the Gambia, the tribe itself, and all of that. So it talks about the Atlantic trading system and the reformation of the Gambia states from the 15th to 17th century, right? And then it goes on to say the course of the Gambia history was radically changed with the arrival of Europeans on the coast. So the Portuguese impact was the most spectacular. The sea coast became from then on the leading front for acculturation the settlement of the portuguese at arguin around 1445 was the first victory of the carvel over the caravan its consequence was the rerouting of trade circuits towards the atlantic right so portuguese seeking gold attempting to penetrate into the sudan along the senegal river and more energetically along the gambia but the fulu falls made navigation up the Senegal River de 
difficult. The Gambia too, the Portuguese faced problems from the dominant Mendy. When in four. 1488, their attempts to build a fort on the banks of the Senegal River failed. The Portuguese resorted to trading along the coast and up the estuaries of the Senegal and the Gambia. Using boats shuttling in from the Cape Verde Islands, they established a solid foothold in the southern re rivers region and in the Gambia because the region was important in the interregional trade of Senegambia. Portuguese traders dealing in gold, ivory, hides, spice, and right from the start, slaves used the old interregional trade circuit for cola, salt, cotton cloth, and iron. Under the Portuguese monopoly, this trade produced profound changes as early as the mid-16th century. In particular, it reshaped the political map of Senegambia. In southern Senegambia, the kingdom of Kabu dominated the southern rivers and Futa Jalan. In northern Senegambia, the, the uh, Wolof Confederation broke up, yielding place to the tiny kingdoms of Walu, Kajor, Bao, Sin, and Saloon. Meanwhile, in the Senegal Valley, the, the Yanke kingdom of Futa Toro consolidated its hold. Everywhere in the region, the process of the political dismemberment of the Senegambian states really under the impact of the Atlantic trading system got underway. All right. So, again, now this book just really goes into the uh, details about this. So as I mentioned earlier, the Portuguese was one of the first, one of the first Europeans to go over there to what we call Central West Africa. They went to places like Senegambia, the Congo, and uh, Angola. Okay, and so when the other Europeans saw what they were doing, they followed the suit. The main thing, what they wanted, natural resources. Because Africa is the richest continent and they have a lot of natural resources over there. So that's what they wanted. They want their natural resources, especially to build up their colonies, build up their lands. All right. Um, so let me tell a little story. So I was talking to a Nigerian sister, right? I was coming home in an Uber, and um, I was talking to a Nigerian sister, and we was having a conversation. So uh, I was coming from the restaurant. One of my favorite restaurants is um uh, is a Senegambian restaurant. Well, the people that own it, they from Senegal, actually. And I love West African food. I love their food. Their food is great, you know. So um, I love their cuckoos and the uh, the lamb and the plantains and all of that. I, I just love their dish. All right, so I was coming home and I was having a conversation with the sister, a Nigerian sister, very beautiful. And she saw that, she was like, She's like, um, what did you order? I said, I had ordered some fufu. And she said, oh, my goodness. She said, I love fufu. She said, I love fufu. I do. Because they eat a lot of fufu in Nigeria as well. So we was having a conversation about the transatlantic slave trade. And we were talking about Senegal and Gambia. All right. She was saying that at one time, Seneg Senegambia was just one. But it was broken up because... The English and the French was fighting amongst each other, right? So the English wanted Senegal, but the French took over Senegal. And they got Gambia instead, okay? So Gambia was occupied by the, the English, whereas Senegal was occupied by the French. So I said, well, I thought that the uh, Gambian people speak French as well. She said, no, not really. Uh -uh. They don't speak French. No. Nah. Now, it's, they speak English. I was like, oh, the, so English is the official language over there in Gambia. She said, yeah. She said it's the official language, but it's the Senegalese that speak French. Because remember, they, they was one land, but they were split up because the English wanted to take over a piece of land. And they wanted Senegal, but then they ended up getting Gambia because of the river over there. And the French had took over Senegal. I was like, oh, wow, that's such a rich history. Like, I really didn't know that. She said, yeah, it's a lot into that. So I said, okay, so basically what it is, is the, so I had got it, Mr. I'm like, okay, it's the Fulani, basically. 
So because there's Fulani people not only in Senegal, but also in Gambia and also in the Ivory Coast and the Guinea area. So the um, Fulani people occupy those areas. Right. And as I was mentioning to you guys earlier, um, I had some co-workers that I used to work with that was um, Fulani and Wolof. So one lady, she was uh, she was Wolof, actually. She was Wolof. She's from she from Dakar, Senegal. So we was having a bill. We was having a conversation. I said, um, you know, anything by, by, uh, do you know anything about Shane Auntie Job? She said, yeah, of course we know a lot about him. You know, we know he was very prominent in our country. Yeah. We know a lot about him. And then she was telling me about the university that was named after him over there and whatnot. And so she said that, uh, I said, so you, she, I asked her what tribe she from. She said, I'm Wolof. I said, okay, you speak Wolof. She said, yeah, I speak Wolof. And um, and she also speak French because again, she's cynically, she know a little bit Arabic because she's Muslim. And she was like, yeah, I speak Wula, but I also speak Fulani. I'm like, you speak Fulani too? She's like, yes, I speak Fulani because the Wula and the Fulani people are pretty much closely related to each other. I was like, oh, I, I was just amazed. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know they were so related, so close with each other. I just thought that you know, they were pretty much a separate group. She was like, not too much. You know, the Fulani people can speak Wolof and the Wolof people can speak Fulani. Like if a person that spoke a Fulani language, the Wolof individual can understand what they, they're saying because that's how close they are with each other. I was like, oh, I was like, that's that's very interesting. Like, that's just weird. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't know that history. But, but yeah, as I also mentioned, I always get it from those individual in the in that region, they always tell me that I look like Fulani, like I'm a Fulani person. I said, well, there might be a possibility, a chance that I might have some Fulani in me. I don't know. I might have some Fulani in my family. I don't know. And she was like, yeah, they was like, yeah, you, you do look Fulani. You look like a Fulani individual. But And that's because of the fact that, again, a lot of the Senegambian people were brought over here. They were brought over here. So there's a high, there's a strong possibility that you may have Fulani and Hauser and Mendico, you know what I'm saying, tribe in you. And as my brother mentioned, you know, you can claim any tribe that you want. You can't, you don't have to just be one particular tribe because we are mixed with multiple ethnic group. We're creolized. We are what I call neo-Africans. We are neo-Africans because we have so many ethnic group mixed in us. So it's not one particular group. So you might have majority of this, you may have majority of that, but you just, you're a Creole. So you miss with Fulani, <laughs> that Wolof, that, that Hauser, the, 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 the Mendinko, the Iwe, the Fawn, the, the, um, the Yoruba, the Igbo, the, the all of that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Whatever, you, you miss with all those tribes in combination. That's what make us us, you know, but, you know, it was a decent conversation I had with the sister. I, I really enjoyed that. I really did. So um, I want to go back and show you guys some more information from this book. And I recommend people to get this book, especially. So. um, So just going down a little bit. So it says the Portuguese trading monopoly, right? From the start, the Portuguese, the first Europeans to explore the African coast, settled at Augin and up to the, uh, um, what's it, Asturias of the Senegal and Gambia rivers. Their aim was to divert the gold trade from the Sudan towards the Atlantic at the occupy Again, around 1445, in a bid to take advantage of the trans-Saharan gold trade from the Sudan, the Portuguese went up the Senegal Valley and made even more strenuous efforts to go up the Gambia River. In Gambia, they were very quickly invaded the key commercial center of Wali, the starting point for the caravans leaking the Gambia north northward up with Upper Senegal and eastward with the Niger Bend. The Gambia thus became the principal outlet for the Wani Mali Empire. Caravans went down the river, a waterway dotted with numerous Mandin principal, principal, uh, principal, principality, excuse me, 
Ooh, principalities, all trading centers in direct contact with the Portuguese trading establishment, obsessed with its search for Sudanese gold, right? And since it is difficult to estimate the quantity of gold traded by Senegambia then, at the time, the region main supplies came from the mines at Boro and Bambouk. Philip Curtin has estimated that in the 16th and 17th century, the quantity of gold explored from Senegambia was no more than 35 kilogram in a good year. On this point, however, there is no reason for leaving out the Senegambian market to total the trade from arguing for that trading post using camel riding nomadic middlemen certainly got its supplies through Bambouk, mainly from the gold mines between the Falime and Bafin rivers. In effect, the main consequences of the Atlantic trading system was to expand Senegambia into the Sahelian zone. This pattern became clear in the 18th century with the development of the gum trade, which irresistibly drew the Berber nomads towards the Senegal River, the center of the Atlantic trading system. Because of the steady decline of the Trans-Saharan trade, the entire southern region of the country now known as Mauritania, beginning from Aguin, came within the orbit of Senegambia, attracted by the Atlantic trading system for that reason, the region came to play an increasingly important role in the evolution of states along the Senegal Valley. So with that being said, right? With that being said, when you have people coming in, taking over your resources, then you also have colonization taking place. You have colonization taking place. Why is that? Because in order to continue to gain natural resources, you have to bring some type of control mechanism over that state or over that country or over that provenance. So how do you do that? You enforce your cultural ideology, your language onto those people in that region. So as I mentioned before, right, as a matter of fact, I got another book that I want to show you guys. And I spoke about this Arthur before in the past. I spoke about him in the past. So just give me a second. Okay, so um, well, I can't find a book right now because I have so many books around. So, but anyways, the name of the Arthur, the name of the Arthur, uh, is Walter Rodney. So I recommend people read Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Undeveloped Africa, because he go into the historical contents of what took place. And he breaks it down so well in his book. He break it down so well. He breaks down. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me see if I can find something. Let me see if I can find something on here. Uh, let me see. Let me uh see if he. Let me see. What does he say? Um, okay, so.
Because I got the physical copy of the book, but... But I can't find it right now. So let me. Let me just go into the previews real quick. Now, Walter Watney was from um, Guyana. He was from Guyana, right? And I also did a video on him as well. So you guys can look through my archives and check the video out. Um, so he explains what is under development. All right. All right. So let me. Hold on, let me uh take off this screen right here. See, cause I had so I got the book, but I can't find it. So all right, so right here he develop he defines what is under development in his book called How You're Undeveloped Africa. So. In this book, he said, having discussed development, it is easier to comprehend the concept of undevelopment. Obviously, undevelopment is not absent of development because every people have developed in one way or another and to a greater or lesser extent. Undevelopment makes sense only as a mean of comparing levels of development. It is very much tied to the fact that human social development has been uneven and from a strictly economic viewpoint, some human groups have advanced further by producing though producing more and becoming more wealthy. So the moment that one group appears to be wealthier than the other, some inquiry is bound to take place as to the reason for the differences. After Britain has begun to move ahead, the rest of Europe in 18th century, the famous British of uh, British economist Adam Smith felt it necessary to look into the causes behind the wealth of nations. And he says, at the same time, many Russians were very concerned about the fact that their country was backward in comparison with England, France, and Germany in the 18th century and subsequently in the 19th century. Today, our main preoccupation is with the differences in wealth between, on the one hand, Europe, North, North America, and the other hand, on the other hand, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In comparison, the first and the second group can be said to be backward or underdeveloped at all times. Therefore, one of the ideas behind underdevelopment is a comparative one. It is possible to compare the economic condition at two different periods for the same country and determine whether or not it had developed. And more importantly, it is possible to compare the economics of two countries at any given time. And see, and then go down, he said, a second and even more indispensable component of modern undevelopment is that it expresses a particular relationship of exploitation, namely the exploitation of one country by another. All of the countries named as undeveloped in the world are exploited by others, and the undevelopment in with which the world is now preoccupied is a product of capitalist, imperialist, and colonialist exploitation. African and Asian society were developing independently until they were taken over directly or indirectly by the capitalist powers. When that happened, exploitation increased and the exploit of surplus ensued, depriving the society of the benefit of their natural resources and labor. This is an integral part of underdevelopment in the contemporary sense. So think about that. Think about this. So basically what he was saying that a lot of these countries was robbed of their natural resources. And what did I mention earlier? They had to get got. They end up getting got by these Europeans. They end up getting got by the Europeans because they were robbed of their natural resources. They were tricked. So here they thinking they doing business, but these Europeans had other agendas. And this is why it saddens me that when I hear black people, especially say they support capitalism, 
and not realizing that what do you know how bad capitalism has ruined us collectively especially here in america how do you really support capitalism how can't you fish your mouth saying i support capitalism because capitalism really deal with individual wealth it don't deal with the wealth as far as the collective is concerned unless you bring the concept of group economics but it's all about individual. Like, how, how can't you really support capitalism? Knowing that what our people had to go through, what, what was taking place, and especially when slavery was involved in the picture, how do you bring about that? How do you fish your mouth and say, I support capitalism? How do you do that? I don't understand it. So when we, as we read Walter Rodney's book, on how you're underdeveloped Africa, and we see all the things that had transpired during the transatlantic slave trade. That was the whole goal of the European is to undevelop those countries so they can continue to control the resources there. Now, if you look at it today, what's going on? Who else is controlling? Those Asians, they coming over there and controlling. You know what I'm saying? So some of these things are, some of these countries, are, a lot of these countries are affected not only by the European, but also by the Arabs. And you got the Asian coming in. So as I mentioned before, these African countries dealt with the double trauma of slavery. They dealt with the trauma of slavery from the trans-Saharan slave trade. And then they dealt with another trauma of slavery from the uh, transatlantic slave trade. OK. And so the whole point I want people to understand and people to know is that. Especially those in the continent. You know, you not only have ancestry in Africa, you also got ancestry here in America. You got ancestry here in America as well. You got ancestry in the Caribbean. You not only uh but the Asian are developing Africa Africa. Okay, in what ways? How are they doing it? In what ways? In what parts of Africa are we speaking of? Because are they doing it as a whole or is it certain parts of Africa? And Akon City. His city is only on certain parts of Africa. I believe he's from Senegal, if I'm not mistaken. That's where he's originally from. I mean, it's something, just think about it. Just think about it. What parts of Africa are you speaking of? Because if that's the case, then a lot of them would not have a reason to come to a place like America or go to places like Britain or go to places like France. If that's the case, they wouldn't go to those places. Have you ever thought about why a lot of uh, immigrants come to places like America, to British and to France? Do you ever think about that? Do you take that into consideration? Because they know that that's where they can go and make income as opposed to being in their homeland. Right, because the Gambians burnt down the Chinese factory because they were exploiting the land. Oh, okay. Uh, Brother Ngozi back. Let me see what Ngozi talking about. What's up, Brother Ngozi? Hey, hey I told you I was coming back, sis. So, yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. Yeah. So, so, so I, I wanted to say this. The power of pan-Africanism or the unification of, 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 of Africans as a whole is very important. You know, I actually admire what the Anglos and the Saxons or Anglo-Saxons or the British did. They put in work for Europe, even though if you study the history of Europe, the British, the Portuguese, the Spanish and all these people fought each other. And, you know, the British got in the game later with the, you know, in slavery, you know, the Portuguese and the Spaniards was doing their thing first, but then the British got in, got in the game later, you know, when they had the, 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 when you deal with the ships, how they, you know, got the last, that Navy ship, they actually um took it from the Spanish and kidnapped uh, people that was on those ships in the last phase of slavery in a portion of North America, whatever, when you study that or whatever. But I admire what Europeans have done, regardless of them being Spanish, Portuguese, French, the mm -hmm. banner of whiteness, the banner of whiteness was put in play for them. So it doesn't matter if you're French, German, Dutch, 
uh, or any subset of whatever European branch ethnically, you're white in North America. And they put in work for white people. And a lot of these so-called white people that's here today are later than your ancestors been here. Some of these white people only got here after 1865. Some of them came out, out here in the Great Depression in 19, after 1930 or 1940. Some of these people are Polish descent. Some of these people are not part of the British that put in work that established the new world of America. Even before America branched off of the UK and fought for its independence and became its own independent thing, they still give homage to their ancestors. You're not going to, like, like if one African nature, nation rise against the French, the British, or any European country, you best believe the United States is going to back them. Because the United States is the military for the European Union. They're going to back them. So what I'm saying is, is that and it's not a shit on. But we have to admire the quality of behavior of war and, and, and admire how they banner together to stand on what they stand on to build a foundation. It ain't for us to hate on them about. What's done is done. Wallahi, what's done is done. So now it's for us to learn from our oppressors or people that put us in this situation. How can we combine as a black people as a whole? From the continent of Africa through the Caribbeans or the portion of North America for us to be back on track or for us to get on track. You get what I'm saying? For what we lack in in certain areas. I think that's important. Oh, yeah. You know what? And it's funny that you brought up about the history of white people while we in this subject. Uh, for those of you that don't have this book, um, I recommend you guys to get this book. It's by, it's by Neil... Ivan Panther. The book is called The History of White People. So it was written by a sister. Okay. And she goes into the history about white people and how they became a white race. And the book that I just showed you guys, right? The book I just posted up to you guys. This book here is called The Birth of a White Nation and the Invention of White People and its Relevance Today by Jacqueline Batalora. All right. So Jacqueline Batalora was born in Scotland, actually. OK, this is a white woman that wrote this book. All right. But you but Brother Ngozi does have a point. You know what I'm saying? And what he's describing is what is called pan-European. Pan-European. That's what he's describing. OK, mm -hmm. so regardless. Yeah, they're going to stick together. They're going to do whatever they can, regardless of what part of Europe they might be from. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't, you know, and, and, and uh, certain people weren't considered white until afterwards, like the Aust Australian, the, the people from Austria, Austria, people Italian, from Italy, people from Austria, people, Austria, Irish, Austria. Yeah, the Irish people. Yeah, yeah, they and wasn't it, considered that, but, but go ahead. Until later yeah, on. They, until later on. And now, the banner of European supremacy or whatever, and I don't hate white people. I'm not a racist. I don't promote racism in any form of fashion. I'm just saying that the banner of whiteness stands out. It doesn't matter if you are a swathy skin Italian with swathy olive skin, or right. you are a, a light, fair, very fair skinned Irish man with red hair and, and some Irish, black Irish got dark hair. But regardless, white is white. You get what I'm saying? And, and they put in work for it to stand out. And not even that. You know, you got people that argue about how blacks or West Africans embrace North African history, but the British embrace Greece as classical yes, Western civilization. They, they embrace Greece and Rome as classical Western civilization. The idea go. of democracy, democracy and liberty and how to run a system and a government. We still got, we still pay homage to Aristotle and Plato and these different things when we understand, you know, the system that was built from the predecessor roots of European civilization or classical European civilization, but the Anglos and the Saxons and the Vandals and the Nordic Europeans, we know in history, the Greeks didn't even fuck with them like that or the Romans didn't deal with them like that. They considered them savages. But at this point in time, when we really study them, we can't do nothing but admire the work that Europeans or, or, or what we classify as white people have done to put themselves in the game. Like, 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 I can't do that. I even admire the Jew, the Ashkenazi. When that per when them cats said never again, you feel me? They not going for that for that shit. They don't tolerate right. certain shit. And you can't do nothing but admire that. Regardless of what people believe, you know, if the Jew is 100% Middle Eastern, it doesn't matter. These Central Eastern Europeans 
who has a, a, a component of Middle Eastern DNA, and they might be less Middle Eastern or Semitic than the Yemenese Jews or the or the or the Samaritans that still live on the land, or even Iranian Jews. But one thing they got in common, regardless to the genetic signature, is the identity of this thing called a Jew. They stand on it and they ride with each other, regardless. Oh, yeah. You feel me? Oh, and yeah, that's the thing. The about, and, 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 and I want to use the Jew for example, even though the Ashkenazi Jew or the Sephardic Jew may have a lot of Southwestern European or North or Central European but from the Ashkenazi, from the Central Eastern European that mixed in, they're mixed, but they still identify with a culture that's connected to the Middle East. So with some African Americans that has a high, a high proportion of European in them, it doesn't make them less African. Right. And the way I deal with Islam is the same way a Jew deals with Judaism. That's his identity. And I know that the cultural ties link me back to my brothers and sisters back on the continent that's largely Muslim. And this idea that more, and this is why I respect Noble Drew Ali, even though some things is exaggerated and it don't make sense historically, a more right. was any Muslim. A more was any Muslim, and especially in, in, in the time of Spain. It didn't matter if you was a, a light skinned Berber, a Syrian, an Arab, or even a black African in the military that they use, they all were banned as Moors. And they were Muslims, Westerner, Maghribi, or whatever group of people. So with mm -hmm. that being said, Moorish American is a Muslim American. It's used as identity. But here's the thing. What roles played a role in the banner of Islam? We know that the Middle East was the founder, founding population of it. We know the Berbers put in plenty of work in it. And we also know the sub-Saharan African component that they're labeling played a major role in it. You know what I'm saying? One thing the Prophet Muhammad said, peace be upon him, he said, so the Arab is not better than the red man is not better than the black man and the black man is not better than the red man. Why is he talking about these black people or a type of black people regardless? Because black people played a role in that portion of time and history. Yeah, and so also, saying, you know, when you, uh, and I don't mean to cut you off, okay, bring up the story real quick since we on Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bring up the story about a Bilal. Bilal, the uh, African uh, brother that was around who was, the, who, was the first, who, was the, who was the first to call out the Adan? You know what I'm saying? If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have it. But, you know, Bilal's story is very tricky because um, some people, in, you know, depending on who's speaking, his father was an uh, Arab and his mother was Habasha. So, I, you know, but even regardless of his mother being Habasha, um, she still was a, a, a African woman. But Africans played a major role in Islam, even outside of just focusing on Master Musa for all the riches that he had. I'm talking about the work that black Africans put in with Islam. Um, even with the brothers and sisters in Sudan, when they had their own, um, the when they were fighting against the Europeans, you know, the work that they put in with it. Um, 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 the, um, the Kanu Banu Empire, the Songhai Empire, you know, uh, uh, Islam, uh, the gave us beautiful, powerful people like Malcolm El Haj Malik Shabazz, aka Malcolm X in North America, you know, all of that. So, what I'm saying is, is that Noble Drali, even though a lot of things in the, in the introduction of Islam that he gave us was not what we should do, but, the, but, but for introduction, I can see the place in a plate position that he was going in and a sense of identity. You get what I'm saying? Because you aren't a Negro. Black is a position in North American. That's not what you called yourself 800 years ago. You didn't call yourself that because you had ethnic groups. Everybody looked the same. So with that being said, it, it, you do supersede those terms. So go ahead, Queen. I'm sorry. Right, and even before Noble Drew Ali, there were black people that identify themselves as African. Like, okay, when we look at the history about the ME church, right? When we look at um uh the Prince Hall Masonry, right? They was considered absolutely African. African absolutely. Yeah, African. So you yes. know the term African yes. was already there. And you know what I'm saying they always been around. So oh and another thing well here's the thing Leo, people say Leo, 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 well, Han Leo Hanberry, a lot of people absolutely mm -hmm. yeah people say well you know, pan-Africanism is dead. Let go of pan-Africanism. Ain't no pan-Africanism. You need to let that go. That's dead. How you feel about that? I think that's disgusting. <laughs> I would never let pan-Africanism go. I'm an African. I would never, pan -Africanism I, is dead. I, I, they I, don't want to deal with us. We need to deal with us. I'm, 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 I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I would never deny Africa. I'm an African. I am an African. Pan-African is not dead. To a house nigga is dead. To a nigga that don't know who he is is dead. To a person that don't don't, don't, don't want to have a history of a, or a background is dead. But that's a slave mind and motherfucker. And I don't even want to be around those type of people. 
I am an African. I do not agree with Pan-Africanism is dead. See, the direction that these house niggas and people are going in is destructive. So with those type of sick people, they don't have a place here for me. I don't even take them serious. But matter of fact, as we say out here in Chirac, them niggas is ops. They are, it ain't nothing you can offer me. They ops. What the fuck could I talk to you about? You don't identify with who you are as an African or a black man or a woman or whatever you want to call us. I would never deny Pan-Africanism. I stand on that shit. I'm going to die with that shit because I take Africa serious. Right. And that, mean, even goes for, and that even goes for a nigga on the continent who try to talk shit about the kidnapped population or groups of people that were brought here and make fun of it. Because in, on Clubhouse, it happens. In other areas, it happens. Oh, yeah. So I heard people call, using a term so, called Akata. But uh, uh, Akata means stray cat. If you really know the history of it, that, that, that if you're a Yoruba American and you've been in, born in America, you go back home. They call you a Kata. It's not. It's, you're just a stray cat. It doesn't deny you from your lineage. You know what I'm saying? It's just a wandering cat. So you know what? That's funny that you said that because I had a bill with a Nigerian. I was telling them why you was gone that I had a bill with a Nigerian sister, and um, yeah, it was just a nice conversation I had with her, and I told her like I was honest with her. Like there's Nigerians who feel some kind of way about us, like. A lot of Nigerians are pretty, you know, pretty much narcissistic towards African-Americans here. And it, it's interesting because a lot of us have Nigerian ancestry as well. You know, so yeah. she was like, she was like, you know what it is? And then she was like, well, and then she was like, well, why do you feel that way? I said, because they use the term Akata. She said the word Akata is not what you really think it is. It's just mean a cat. And she said the reason why a lot of Nigerian feel that way, because they were taught that you know, about black people, they would talk the wrong information about black people here in America. And they would talk yeah. to come here and just get a right. college degree, get an education, be yeah. just, you know, very uh prestige and be higher up. So that's yeah. basically, but, yeah, she was saying, and she was but, like, she, she get clowned on by other Nigerians when they see her uh, doing the type of work that she doing. Cause she was an Uber driver. So then she was like, yeah. if uh, another Nigerian see her doing like a, a Uber driving, they would say something to her. They would be like, why are you doing this? Right. You know, you're better than this. You, you, you way above this. You don't right. need to do this. Well, so it's a right, condemnation right, right. amongst them as well. Yeah. But that's a beautiful thing though. I'm not mad at them when they do that. I mean, the new wave of African-American culture is destructive. Especially oh, yeah. when you got niggas that say, when you got niggas that say, I ain't African, I'm black or I'm Aboriginal. Or I'm this, I'm that. Or, 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 or this drill music or this deaf society or the deaf culture that's promoted in a new, in new African-American culture. It's disgusting. So I'm not mad at the educated Nigerian or educated uh, African that comes here and don't want to be bothered with the fuck shit. Because I don't want to be bothered with the fuck shit. I know you don't want to be bothered with the fuck shit. So delineation is needed. It's, it's, it's like, 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 wallahi, it's needed. So my thing is, is that I can understand them. I'm not saying that they write to say that for a whole banner of people, but we one and the same. I actually admire and respect when I see the Nigerian come here and overdo an education than other groups of people because it goes to show the racial uh, um, standard when they said the Negroid man was low IQ and this Negroid man that they brought here was Nigerians. And then when you oh. see these Nigerians, out, when you see these Nigerians outdo them in academia and they become doctors and lawyers it actually kills the stereotype because racism has to end the, these these social constructs has to be destroyed and a nigerian breaks that banner wallahi so i, I really respect my nigerian brothers and sisters wait a minute so, but, mm -hmm. have you mm -hmm. heard of uh, this um have you heard this anthropologist he was a very popular around the 1800s his name was antonar fanar he was from haiti antonar fanar but well, what about him? I never heard of him, sister. Okay, so he wrote a book. It uh, well, it's written in French. As a matter of fact, let me put it up. Let me pull up his name while we on this uh subject. All right. So this is the picture of um. You know, as a matter of fact, let me pull up the book that he wrote. Okay. So the name of the book right here, right? Um. There we go. All right. So here's the book right here. The name of it is called The Equality of the Human Races. And his name is Antonar Furman. Antonar Furman, right, was a Haitian uh, anthropologist. So he pretty much was one of the first to uh, disambiguate the whole concept about, you know, blacks being inferior to um, 
to Europeans. So because at that time there would they was dealing with the scientific racism. All right. So he happened right. to be one of the first uh, anthropologists to say, you know what, well, we going we going to uh, pretty much cut that out. We're going to cut that out the picture because that's a lie. Basically, that's what he was saying. He said, it, it, I'm going to di I'm going to disambiguate that because them white folks don't. Well, I'm just going to translate what he was saying. Basically, these white folks don't know what they're talking about. They they don't realize they that don't. we all are, we all uh, homo sapiens. You know what I'm saying? We all humans. That's right. you know, regardless. That's so, right. So for you to say that uh, I'm inferior because I'm categorized as black and you're superior because you're categorized as white. You know what I'm saying? That is problematic and that is wrong and that's erroneous. And, and as a matter of fact, he did a, uh, as a matter of fact, I did a video on him, but um, I'm going to show the article real fast. Okay, so I'm just going to pull up the wiki article real fast, real quick. All right, so and uh, let me go ahead and pull it up. All right, so this is uh, Atenar Furman, okay? That's Atenar Furman. Um, so let's go down to and as a matter of fact, he was the founder of Pan Africanism. Uh oh, he was the founder of Pan. He, he was one of the founders of Pan Africanism. So we're gonna get to that. But check this out, though. Check this out right well, here. I will, I, I will be posting that ancestor and, and, and getting and putting a picture right, of right his here. brother because he's important. Mm -hmm. Right. He says the equality of human races in his best known work. Right. It's written in French. Okay. So uh, of the equality of human races, published in 1885. Now, this is what it came out after the death of Charles Darwin, because, you know, Charles Darwin, Darwin passed away in 1882. But anyways, it says Furman tackles two bases of existing theories on black inferiority in an effort to critique Gobineau, um, which is of inequality of human races. Right. So on one on the one hand, Furman challenges the idea of brain size or was it cephalic index as a measure of human intelligence on and on the other, he reasserted the presence of African blacks in for running Egypt. He then develops into the significance of the Haitian revolution of 1804 and ensuing achievements of Haitians such as Leon Adon and Isaiah Jonti in medicine and science and Edmund Paul in the social science. So both Adon and John T. had obtained prizes from the Académie Nationale de Medicine. So, and also it talks about being the founder of Pan-Africanism. So Furman is one of three Caribbean men who launched the idea of Pan-Africanism at the end of the 19th century to combat colonialism in Africa. As a candidate in Haiti, 1902 presidential, presidential election, he declared that Haitian states should serve in the rehabilitation of Africa, along with Trinidadian lawyer Henry Sylvester Williams and also a fellow Haitian Benito Savian. He was the organizer of the first Pan-African Conference, which took place in London in 1900. That conference launched the Pan-Africanism movement. W.E.B. Du Bois attended the conference and was put in charge of drafting the general report. After the conference, the five Pan-African Congress were held in the 20th century, which eventually led to the creation of the African Union. All right, so Furman was invested in the three main elements of Pan-Africanist thought, the rejection of the postulated of race inequality, proof that Africans were capable of civilization, an example of successful Africans producing knowledge in diverse fields, and looking to move away from the biological understanding of race. Furman's scientific approach was informed by the idea of a black Egypt as the source of Greek civilization. So, and also goes on about pan caribbeanism right? Um, it talks about that, but yeah, the main concept uh, is about the equality of human races. So he was basically debunking the book that was written by uh, Gnobio, right, on the equality of human races. So basically, he was pretty yeah. much, yeah. So he but, was, uh, huh? I, yeah, I, was, I just wanted to say, I, I, yeah, he was pretty much debunking them. And, and what I'm saying is, I, I just want to say this, Tiffany. I love seeing Nigerians and African Americans, but Nigerians that the African American descent from, right? Mm -hmm. Who's who 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 would be who would be classified as super Negroid, 
because they don't have a lot of the, the the traits that we accumulated from our situation because of here you know a lot of people in the bread with other groups of people so a lot of these people are strongly will be classified as super negro and when you see them achieve and do everything that they do it kills the dumb shit that that's been promoted in north america for hundreds of years stupid shit it doesn't make sense but when you look at this nigerian doctor this nigerian lawyer this nigerian accountant this night it kills that shit so 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 we can look at the population today and see it even you even got you know, uh, another group of people that's very sharp is a lot of Nalotic people, Nalotic speaking people, Dinka. When they come to North America, the a lot of the Dinka and the Nua. people do not, uh, the, from, the, the, from Nubia? From Sudan. From, 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 from Sudan. From South, from South Sudan. Oh, yeah, a lot yeah, of the yeah. Dinka, mm -hmm. a, lot of them, a lot of them go to Texas. A lot of them go to Texas and they go to, um, they go to, uh, Texas and they go to, um, Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, my friend, my friend, she's there. Um, they go to Texas and they go zone around Minnesota, but a lot of them go there and they are very smart. Again, race or the idea of race does not determine intelligence. There that's you pseudo. go. There you go. And that's the whole point that Antonio we, 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 Furman we. was trying to indicate, uh, you know, the Haitian brother. So Antonin Furman was Haitian, but yeah, that was he was that was his whole point. He was basically saying that your race do not determine your intelligence. And what he was trying to combat against is that whole, which is now considered pseudoscience, is phrenology. So phrenology deals yes. with the size of the brain. So based on the size yeah. of your brain, supposed to tell your intellect, etc. You know what I'm saying? So he yeah. was combating that as that is not that's not scientific. You can't determine Absolutely. a person's brain size just by saying. Okay, this person is intelligent, or if they're unintelligent, you can't do that. That's yeah. that's impossible. Again, this man was an anthropologist. Okay, and so he has Dang. influenced so many people. So it says here that Bernard uh, pioneered the integration of race and physical anthropology, and maybe the first black anthropologist. His work was recognized not only in Haiti but also among African scholars as an early work of negritude. He also influenced on uh, Jean Price. Mars, the founder of Haitian ethnology and uh, American anthropology, Mabel, uh was it Herskovitz? If I'm saying his last name right, Herskovitz. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so he influenced that. So it says he also followed the ideas of Auguste Comte. Furman was a stark positivist who believed that the empiricism used to study humanity was a counter to the speculative philosophical theories about the inequality of races. So Furman sought to redefine the science of anthropology in his work. He critiqued certain conventional, I mean, conventionally held aspects of anthropology, such as uh, was it chronometry and racial racialist interpretation of human physical data he was the first to point out how race typologies failed to account for successes of those mixed race as well as one of the first to state an accurate scientific basis for skin pigmentation man that's powerful i'm glad you introduced me to him i knew nothing of him and yeah. that's a forefather. that's a forefather to our culture in north america i, I especially pan-africanism I hey wallahi that's 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 beautiful and and I'm gonna I'm gonna start venerating and honoring that ancestor. Yeah, that's, that's his name, Antonar Furman. I typed his name okay. in the uh, description. Oh link. yeah. So yep, that's yeah. him. That's his name, Antonar yeah. Furman. Yep, yeah, he, he was a Haitian anthropologist, one of the first black Haitian anthropologists. Um, he doesn't, and you know, it's kind of sad that certain people don't, um. Certain people don't receive recognition for the work they have done. Like, it's just really, you know, they overlook, they are overshadowed. You, you know what I'm saying? You had a, so, you had a, you, you had an African American Egyptologist that was running with, um, he was, he exists in a, what time period? It's not, cause I'm in the streets now. Um, that brother, he, he, he exists with the guy who deciphered Metal Netter. Um, 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 you know, what's the, the French guy. We always talk about them backwards and forwards. Oh, you talking about Chapoleon. Um, Jean Chapoleon? Chapoleon. Yeah, yeah. John, 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 John Chapoleon. But it was an African American um, Creole black man from Louisiana um, um, who 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 was involved with Egyptology. People don't even talk about him. Oh, uh, maybe okay. if you African could look American more. man. Um, with um, and type up that French guy named John Chapoleon. Uh, if I'm I mean, not John uh, uh, Chapoleon. Okay. Yeah, he was he he was with him, but he he got involved in Egyptology. He was a black man from Louisiana. 
from Louisiana. Let me see his name. Uh oh my goodness. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Okay, hold on. Let me look him up. Let me look at Jean Chapoleon. Or a type of African American Egyptologist from Louisiana in the 18th or 1700s. He should pull up. Okay, African American Egyptologist from Louisiana, 1800s or 1700s, whatever time period that was. If not, I will make sure you get it because I sent it to Malik, the article about him. You say during the 1700s? Uh, what, 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 where was that when um, Chapoleon exists? What, 1800s? Uh, seven? Uh, around the 1800s. Yeah, about the early 1800s. One of them. Late 1700s or early 1800s. I don't want to put out any misinformation, but I will get that article to you about that indiv this individual. But he got involved in Egyptology and he started running with him. Um, is Are you talking about... Uh, ooh, let me see. Ooh, don't, don't get me the line, honey. Let me see. Let me see. Let me make sure. Let me make sure we on the same page. Um, Louisiana. Uh, is it Norbert Aurelio? Is that him? Is he, is he from Louisiana? That might be him. Look uh, him yeah, it says that he from Louisiana. It says that he is from um. It said he was from New Orleans, uh, territory of Orleans. So he he uh was born in eighteen oh six. He died in eighteen ninety four. Let me see. Uh, let me see what type of work that he did. Uh, that might be him. <laughs> Let me see. Ooh, that might not be him. I don't think this him though. Um, you know what? As a matter of fact, I think it is. Says in Paris, Rolio became interested in Egyptology and hieroglyphics, yeah. which he studied with the family of Jean Francois Napoleon. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's him. So yeah, there you go. Let me show so, the people that who we talking about. Let let's show who we talking about here. So for those of you that's curious of what Ngozi talking about, um, just to give you an idea, and one day I'm gonna do a, a information on this man. Because I got to find out more information. So his name is Norbert Relio. So Norbert Relio was a Louisiana Creole um, inventor who was widely considered one of the earliest chemical engineers and noted for his pioneering invention of the multiple effect evaporator. This invention was an important development in the growth of sugar industry. Relio, a French speaking Creole, was a cousin of painter Edgar Degas. So, so yeah. So basically, what Ngozi is talking about. Um, this guy has looked into the work of um a uh, Jean uh, uh Jean Chapoleon. So yeah, so yeah, that's basically who Ngozi is talking about. So let's see, you know what? Yeah, I have to find out more information about him. So I have to uh, oh look, yeah, yeah. I have to look up more information about him. Yeah, but I see who you're talking about, right? I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I, so, yeah it, 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 it's really important for us to recognize what our early ancestors and the Africans did in North America and how they was fighting to maintain their Africanness. I mean, this new shit that niggas is on is different. Like, uh, I'm not African. I'm Native American. I'm Aborigine. I ain't never been to Africa. I, I, or, or they get so disrespectful. They say shit like, I'm just black. I ain't no African, I'm black. But they forget, nigga, you call black because you come from people from sub-Saharan Africa who were dark skinned. They labeled them as black first. The first mm -hmm. people to be called black before the Portuguese called the continent or the people the south of the Sahara yeah, black no. is the people in Sudan. Bilal al Sudan, land of the blacks. And then after that, you know, the Portuguese came in and started calling the people in Angola and Cameroon Negro or Negro, you know what I'm saying, which is black. So what I'm saying is that they, these people call that first and they call you that because I, you lost all the identity of ethnic groups and you were combined in Mississippi and Louisiana and Carolina backyards. You had nothing else but to be, but to be banned as a, as, a, as, a, as a label as black because that's all you had. It's just stupid shit. Like, like, so for these niggas to denounce Africa is ridiculous. It's disgusting. All right. And let me ask you this. <laughs> How do you feel when people say that all right, when it when it comes to a, a DNA, for example, right? They say that DNA is biological when it comes to deal with uh paternity tests, but it's not biological when it comes to deal with ancestry tests such as 23 me and ancestry and um African ancestry. They are they are they are idiots. The thing about the human genome and these small sample DNA tests that 23andMe and Ancestry is that, first of all, the human uh, genome only been mapped out since 2003 or 2002. So this is new. Mm -hmm. But it does, tell, it does tell who you are, not fully, but highly, in a sense of the signatures that's seen based off regions, right? It's based off regions. So the thing is, is that it, it, it's, it's, it's legit. 
It is legit. It's just that yeah, it's, because it's people were able to family. find their family. They, they were able to find a family. Is able to find a family. It's fairly, but the thing is, is that it's fairly new, and it gets better and better every year. That's why with ancestry DNA, it tell it upgrades and give you a better, better, better uh uh, uh proxy that's used to give you a better identity or uh, 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 a banner of what regions you come from. And autosomally speaking, you know, it's based off region and national borders today. So here's the thing: you can have a difference. It's a difference between a, gene, a, a genealogical ancestor and a biological ancestor. Like for example, you may have an ancestor that exists. 500 years ago, but it may not show up in your autosomal DNA. They may have been one a full Native American, and all you got in this person is traces, but overall, you're autosomally highly sub-Saharan African. So the thing is, is that when you start dealing with these DNA tests, it's fairly new, but it tells you who you are highly. But it upgrades every year because it gets better and better. That's the thing about science. Now, when it comes to a DNA tests from African ancestry DNA, they base their analysis off a small percentage of your DNA, which is your haplogroups or sex chromosomes, which only make up less than 1% of your DNA. And they tell you based off your haplogroup that you come from this area. But they, but you have to be very careful when you read the data, because when they read the SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, or, short or go through the short tail and repeats that's used, right? When they read them, it says you share genetic ancestry with people in Senegal and Gambia. A haplogroup cannot tell you where you from because your haplogroup could be shared with multiple ethnic groups. For example, my Y chromosome is EP252, aka E1B1A78. That's common in Yoruba man, but it's also common in Bimelike man. And you mm -hmm. got a few Fulani men with it. And you got a few Mandinka men with that clade of E1B1A. So what I'm saying is even though it's highly in Yoruba man, if I was to take his test and to say I'm Yoruba, but the Y chromosome exists, that snip or that small signature of Y chromosome is shared with multiple ethnic groups in those borders of Western Central Africa. So so that's what I'm saying. So it doesn't tell you directly where you're from. It just tells you who you share a paternal line with. So that's the trick. So it's not telling, but here's the thing. But because you do know you share a paternal line with these people mm -hmm. and you do know autosomally that your genetic signatures is, is from these regions, now it's up to you as a West African American, a Western or uh, African North American Creole, but I'm just gonna say as an African in the diaspora. Or Neo-African. <laughs> A neo African to choose to identify yourself with one portion of the region that you feel you are fully because it's still all you. Because all those people wasn't that far off from one another genetically, they're all the same people. It's just slight differences at the client or regional level because they've been separated from one another. So you're going to find selective differences and small signatures, but it's not enough to make them separate. Even as a even as human beings as a whole, we're 99.9% .9 the same. Homo sapiens hasn't spent enough time to be separate, even as a subspecies. We're all the same. So when it comes to a Nigerian, uh, a, a man in Senegal, a man in Cameroon, they're going to be much more closer to one another, even though we're all the same at 99.9%. .9 but I'm saying when you look at the small demi level, they're going to be, or clinal levels when it comes to clients, they're going to be much more closer to one another than a man in Norway or a man in, 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 in Papua New Guinea, even though we're all as a species 99.9% .9 the same. So regionally, you may differ from multiple ethnic groups, but it's up to you to select which region that you choose to be in and you can repatriate back into those ethnic groups fully. Right, like, 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 like for me, like my mother's Fulani, my mother, but my mother's Americanized as hell because she's been there since she was four years old. But my thing is that my father's an African American. Me personally, I don't identify. I repatriated back with the Mandinka. I was adopted back into that culture. I live by the customs and the, and 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 everything that 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 my griots and my elders tell me to. I report back to Guinea and Gambia. Gambia is the capital. You know, you know my brother Kamara. You know who Kamara is. Oh yeah, so yeah, 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 I know. So with that being said, it's very important for me to live by that. So I identify as Mandinka, even though I may come from multiple ethnic groups from my ancestors that was kidnapped. But overall, I repatriated back and I found my way back and I chose to accept myself and choose to be Mandinka. And nobody can tell me I'm nothing less. <laughs> right. You and know. then like, exactly. And I was dealing with somebody earlier because uh, I was uh, talking about we were talking about the haplogroups, groups, right? And we were talking about the North Africans and all that. So I was saying about my genetics, right? According to 23Me, it says that I have what is called the L3D1-5. So yeah. now it's a lot of information. They, they don't really know about the uh, L3D1-5, but there is information on L3D1 as far as like yeah. the haplogroup is concerned. And when I discovered what I looked online on Wikipedia, 
Um, I seen that uh, the Fulanis and I think is the uh, Bambara people and the Bambara, also, the Fulani, yeah. the Fulani Bambara, a few yeah, the um, Mandinka, a few, yeah, they the carry those. Yeah, they carry that yes. because the L three D, huh? And some Yoruba have L three D. Yeah, because the L three D goes back to I think was it East Africa, North Northeast yes. Africa, somewhere in that region, right? And they cross right. through, they cross through the Sahel. Right, yeah, they yeah they cross over there to Sahil, yeah, yeah. But um, again, they don't know where the uh the you know the D one dash five come from as far as like exactly, but they know that it comes from that lineage of those who carry the L three D one, right? And Correct. those who got the L three D one comes like you said from East Africa and uh, go over to Sahil area, etc. Yes, it's like me. I'm L three F, and that's my mitochondria. That's your mitochondria. I'm L three F. A lot of Pulera, like like the house of Pulani, have L three F one B L three F one B six. You have L three F one B one A L three F one B one, which is shared with Pulani and some Yoruba. But then Pulani women also have L two, and then you got a clade of it that's shared with some Amazigh Berber, which is the L three F one B one A one. You know what I'm saying? Which is a whole nother clay. It it, it ships, and even the Bija is clay is the L three F. So what I'm saying is is that it's really tricky to say, yeah. and, and a Timne as well. And even some Bantu uh, speakers, which shows that, you know, when you study the Bantu history before the, the pre-Bantu speakers, before they ended up in Cameroon and Angola, a lot mm -hmm. of their earlier ancestors come from the Sahil as well, from Mindy, uh, pre-Mindy groups, because we know the closest language family that's close to proto niger Congo are the proto Mandinka languages that shared at earlier phases. And, and, and according to Professor Irish from Dental Analysis of Skulls, he looked at the Keepians. The Keepians shared a lot of the dentri uh, dentry or uh, a certain dental analysis with the pre-Bantu speakers, which shows the Bantus wasn't in those areas for a long time. And when you get into places like um, looking at the grave in Shamranka, the Shamranka population that was in Cameroon at that time, they lacked a lot of the components that the recent Bantu speakers have. These people are all part of a super Niger Congo population. They used to roam through the early Sahara before dispersing south. And, and then even studying sickle cell, which developed in the wet phase of the oh, Sahara. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. You know what? You know, I'm glad you brought that thing. up. I'm glad that you brought that up because I'm, I'm going to try to get a brother on here because he knows a lot about sickle cells and also yeah. about malaria. I'm going to try to get yeah. him on here one day to have that conversation because I think that it's also very important, especially that, you know, we, we come from... You know that our ancestors, when they came over here, they also brought uh malaria and you know a lot of them had sickle cells too. You know, yeah. So yeah, I got the trait. I got the trait. I'm sure. I don't know if you got the trait, but I got the trait. Uh, do you? You don't know? <laughs> no, I, I'm not sure, but you know, it's a strong possibility that I might have it. I, I won't deny yeah. it. it. Might be, and then it might be yeah. depending on my blood type too. You know what I'm saying? So. You know, blood types yeah. have a lot to do with certain things. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm, but, be I'm, I'm be positive. But yeah, I think, go ahead. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, since we're on this conversation about the haplo groups and like, you know, uh, because what people don't understand is how, you know, complicated that DNA is because DNA is not something that you can see with a naked eye. You know what I'm saying? It's not like you can just look at it and say, oh, I see the DNA. You know what I'm saying? No, Correct. you have to put it under the microscope to actually, you know, see it. <laughs> you know yes. what I mean? And you have to take that, you know, you have to asteroid the strain out of there to actually, you know, look at it and understand the genetic codes and be able to, mm -hmm. like, trace it back to where, you know, the origin and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And I think that uh, I was uh, saying this earlier. I think that, you know, one day we should all be able to have a conversation with those brothers and sisters from North Africa. Um, you know what I'm saying? Be able to uh, hopefully get them on here on the platform so we can disambiguate this whole thing about, you know, the racism and the 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 um the whole bigotry thing or whatever, because I think there's a misunderstanding, you know, and I know that you know you tried your best to try to explain to the best of your knowledge as far as like what is DNA and how you know, as far as like the genetic component of you know, those in uh, North Africa and things like that. But it's always like perceived as you trying to sound racist. But I understand uh -huh. exactly where you're coming from because, you know, we like I like I was uh, like on my ancestry. And as a matter of fact, I can pull up my twin three ancestry right now as we speak uh -huh. Um, on my twin three. And um, 
my twin three and me ancestry says that I have like some form of North African in me. So I have some form of North African in me. And um, I, I mean, think I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, go ahead, sister. And East Africa. So, you know, so I have a small percentage. Yeah. And that small percentage comes from the fact that I don't think it's all West African people, but certain ones had, you know, East African in them. You know what I'm saying? Because they, you know, came from those regions and they was, you know, some of them came from that region, came over there. And like you say, the Bantu expansion and stuff. West Africans are hybrids in their own way. What I mean by that is, is before they have these new ethnic groups, for example, um, the West African, if you have, if you have hyper group E, hyper group E1B1A is not from uh, south of the Sahara West. It was inserted there with those Kipians who used to exist in the Green Sahara. Before mm -hmm. that, you had ghost populations in Central and East African hunter-gatherers Roman in West Africa before the later, uh, before we combined and became what we are. Um, even if you look up the Mandinka and you go to the genetics or go to the history, the Mandinka already were, and especially those that was in the Sahel, they're going to have some Eurasian in them or North African in them because they were already dibbling and dabbling with the salt and gold trades with Amazigh North. So they're going to have 5% Berber or 10% Berber. And then by the time some of those people get stripped and brought over here, and, but you mix with more Africans, so more populations from further south, your Berber or North Africa components, it, it, it decreases to 2% to 1%, in some cases, point percentile. So you're going to find traces of that because you have ancestors that were stripped or came from populations that came from the Sahel. So it only makes sense. Um, we cannot deny North African cousins because they no. have a long history. They have a long, I want to say this now. I don't talk racist because I respect North Africans. I look at them as my cousins and I respect them as being Africans. I don't disrespect those people by calling them Arab. I understand the history of North Africa. I understand the genetics of North Africa. North Africans have a very strong history regardless to what they look like. They are not Arabs. I could be arrogant enough to say that some Arabs have always been darker <laughs> in skin tone than a lot of a lot of the uh, Amazigh uh, people. I don't want to call them Berber because Berber is an insult. It means barbarian. But the Amazigh people, they were always a lot of these people were always fair. Now, if you go back into the Ibero Marusians, they were dark skinned, but there has been a lot of back migration in that portion of Africa because of the proximity, uh, the location, and Egypt is a transcontinental country. So there's been a lot of backwards and forth going on amongst North Africa, West Asia, and a lesser Caucasus for over 23,000 years, right? So we can't d denounce that. But you also have certain signatures that drifted down. With population that we come from, especially those men with Hapra Group E. The Kipian men were related to the Ibero Marusians. And the Ibero Marusians was a situation that was based off the Middle Stone Age North Africans called the Tyrians, who mixed with uh, uh, Eurasians that back migrated from the Near East 23,000 years ago, bringing in MTDNA U6. M1 came in through the Arabian Peninsula 40,000 years ago, but we know what she looked like 40,000 years ago because a lot of the Adamanese people in south of India is M2, M3, M4, M5. So we're not dealing with the earlier Eurasians were very close to Middle Stone Age North Africans. Um, and after that, and after that, you, the, 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 the signature that's coming from the, um, the Neolithic Europeans, which is the Anatolian farmers that came through the eastern Mediterranean of Turkey, is when you start finding the lighter skin population coming in, probably as early as 6,000 or 7,000 years ago. When I and, and with this mutation of SLC245, uh, we talk about it, sodium, potassium, calcium exchange of 55, you're looking at the 111 amino acid changes position when, from islanine to thyronine. And a lot of this comes from not just the lower texture of ultraviolet radiation, it comes from farming, the barley. It's, it's impossible for you to, uh, to have higher levels of dark pigmentation and altitudes of ultraviolet radiation and you're dealing with more grain. So in nature, if you don't use it, you lose it. So islanine changes its position to thyronine. That's what happened. It is not a bad thing. This is just the will of nature. So some of these people were very fair for a very long time and they adjusted and adapted. Then you have to deal with conversion evolution. Then mm -hmm. you have to deal with, and when you deal with conversion evolution, it's just like with the people in Papua New Guinea and some people in Australia, if you look at the uh, 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 spectrum, they're genetically far from Africans, but they look like tropical Africans. Some people right. And see, here's the thing that, with those in Papua New Guinea, they don't mm -hmm. really identify themselves as Asian. I noticed that because I had Nobody one guy black. on my page that was uh, from Papua New Guinea. They, they call themselves black. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because those Asian people, I guess what the area they at, they deal with a lot of racism. Yeah, they do. 
they, I mean, that's the that's the thing about the world. Anything that's the dark would be classified as black in their features. They they they're very old people, but genetically they're far off from us. They biologically, I mean, genetically, I'm talking about, and not as a species, we're all 99.9. But I'm saying, in in the little expression, and certain pairs of the genes, they're just, they're they they're genetically far off from us. And what I'm saying is, is that, um, the earliest Eurasians that back migrated, even if they were robust via, listen to me, robust via. Caucasoid, even though in anthropology a lot of those terms are, uh, you know, out, out outdated and it doesn't determine what you look like. Those people were darker skin because at that time, um, the, the SLC two forty five mutation did not express itself yet. So if you're looking at a back migration twenty three thousand years ago, and in some cases forty thousand, you're looking at darker skin people coming back in. You get what I'm saying? So we're not mm -hmm. talking about that. But what we're talking about is the population that came in. Is the lighter skin population is those Anatolian farmers that went through southern Europe and came through North Africa. And in some parts of North Africa, it was barren land. Everything wasn't populated with people. And these people found the land and they stayed there. And then, you know, we go from indigenous to endogenous to autochthonous because it becomes a genetic imprint signature that becomes adaptive. So we have to deal with conversion evolution, parallel evolution, bottlenecks, founder effects, genetic drifts, and all that that plays a, a major role with this land. So I, I mm -hmm. think that we should talk to our North African brothers and sisters, yeah. respect yeah, them as so African. That, right. So that way, you know, that can uh, disambiguate all the enigma and the confusion that's taking place. So, Correct. you know, that way nobody feels like, oh, you're taking away this day and other. So now <laughs> I pulled up my ancestry, you know, for uh, a reason to uh, kind of show the example. So, right. So right here, as you can see that I am 90.6% sub-Saharan African. According to God. wow, my according to twenty three me, and this, are, and this you're was African. updated you on July eighteenth of twenty twenty two. That was the updated version. Okay, you trying to show out? You trying to show out, Tiffany? Okay, so now out. let me let me break something down <laughs> to the people out there. So just because when you see something being updated, that does not mean that the DNA has changed. The DNA doesn't change. The DNA remains the same. It's just that more information has That's been right. discovered about someone's DNA because remember DNA is very complex and to really understand That's you know right. so all the stuff that right. is talking about some of y'all may not get it some of y'all may feel like oh that that's just too much of what he's saying it don't make sense what is he saying but he's basically <laughs> breaking down the uh, bioanthropology of this you know what I'm saying that's how complex and DNA is it's really it, it I mean he tried to explain it in the most simple way so you guys can understand it but it's not easy to really understand. So even with scientists, you know, with all the upgrade of technology, they have to go back and look at the information and see like, okay, we missed this part right here. Oh, we didn't know that this is this. Oh, okay. We didn't know that is this. So now we got to go back and update and keep updating until we find out more. So it's a lot more to be discovered. But so far, you know, just to show you guys what my ancestry looking like. All right. Um, okay. So, so far, this is my ancestry right here from 23 Me. So I am 90.6% Sub-Saharan African. As you can see, West African, 78.7%, right? And I have a high percentage of Nigerian, which is 42.2%, right? And so um, Senegambia is 5.2%, okay? All right. Um, and the reason why I have a lot of Nigerian, the uh, reason why a lot of us have Nigerian in us is because later on, you know, down the road when after uh, slavery was illegal, uh, they was bringing more and more Nigerian people over here and those Nigerian people, you know, you know, procreated and stuff like that. So a lot of them that came over here, if you study about the Igbo lander, right? So the Igbo lander, a lot of Igbos was brought over here and a lot of them were very rebellious. They fought against the slave masters. They jumped off the ship and they did all of that. So uh, the Igbo landing took place in what is known today as St. Simon Island, Georgia. So if you go to that historical site, that's where you'll find it. And that area is uh, over there in that area is Dunbar Creek. So a lot of them jumped off the boat and they tried to commit suicide because they didn't want to be considered. They didn't want to be here. They, they they was very rebellious. The Igbo people was very rebellious at that time period. And the, um, as a matter of fact, when the Europeans went over there and first got them, they were told they were warned that, hey, these people are going to fight back. They are not going for it. They're going to fight back to all. They're they going to fight with all they might. They're going to fight with all they soul. They're going to fight back. But hey, they, Tiffany, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to be back, sister. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. So, yeah, basically, um, 
Yeah, I just want to show you guys my ancestry here. Um, so with this ancestry, right, going down here would say Congolese and Southeast Africa. So I have 11.6% Congolese in me. Okay. So I have that in me. Um, right down here, you see Angola and Congolese 10.5%. And then I have Southeast African in me. So the South, the Southern East Africa is what? Over here, Uganda, uh, Tanzania, and Kenya area, 0.5%. Now let's go over to where it says, um, all right, uh, let's go down to where it says Northeast African. So I have 0.1% Northeast African in me, all right? And the Brawley North e Northern East African, 0.1%, and the Brawley Sub-Saharan African, 0.2%. So now what is that? So again, what is that? That area is the Northern East Africa, which spans from Sudan in the north to Ethiopia and Somalia. All right. So as you can see, we carry those genetic. I carry those genetics in me. All right. Because again, one of those, you know, those ancestors, whoever my ancestors were, they left this region. Right. And they went over to uh west africa or what's known today central west africa and they missed in and that's how i had the genetic components that i have today okay um and as you can see i have european in me 8.7 percent um i have a high percent of northwestern european which is 6.9 percent right okay so as you can see this is the region over here and uh, it says british british and irish <laughs> all right uh you know, and then I got the Southern European, and then also I have, um, you know, a, a trace of ancestry of 0 0.6, Filipino, uh, Austronesian, and Indigenous American, which is 0.2%. So I have a little bit of that. All right, so um, going down here, it says unassigned, so they don't know it's like some type of unknown DNA where they can't really detect per se. So they don't really know, So, but they just know that I'm missed with something else. And then down here, it says my recent ancestry is the Caribbean. So my recent ancestry was found in Jamaica, in St. Andrew Parish. Why? And why does this play a role? Because um, when the slave trade was happening, right, they was also taking the Caribbean people out of the, yeah, they were taking those Africans from the Caribbean, bringing them to America. And so also that's another thing too. A lot of those Caribbean carry the Nigerian ancestry in them as well. So not only a lot of, not only a lot of Nigerians was brought over here to America, but also, but also, but also those Caribbeans had a lot of Nigerian ancestry as well. So they was transported over here. So that's why, um, as you can see here, right, going going down here, just looking at my ancestry, now it says highly likely match. So it says right here, number one, St. Andrew Parish. Okay, this is St. Andrew Parish, right? It's near Kingston. And then Westmore Parish, right? Right here on the far end is over there by Mantengo Bay, Lucia. All right. So they said Jamaica has 14 administrative regions and we found the strongest evidence of your ancestry in the following two regions. OK. All right. So so that's my uh, that's the ancestry they found so far. So they found that I have more ancestry in St. Andrew Parish than I do in Westmore. But this is the main two region in Jamaica. OK. All right, but you know, just showing you guys my ancestry test. All right, and this is, uh, this is what it looks like. So again, you know, science without history is nothing. History without science is nothing either, because you got to have one, and it can't be one without the other. You got to have both of them, because pretty much science tells a story of history, right? Science back up history through genetics. OK, and history pretty much tell the story of science. So that's why I wanted to show you guys that. All right. And uh, what Ngozi was talking about, you know, again, deals with anthropology. It deals with biology, but it deals with bioanthropology because you have to deal with the culture. You have to deal with the um, archaeological information, the linguistics and all of that. So it's very complex. And as you can see, when he 
broke down the haplo groups and all these different groups. It's very complicated. It's very complicated to comprehend because you have to really study it in order to really understand what he's talking about. So, you know, a lot of stuff may not seem like it makes sense. You might think that it's one way, but it's really not. So we get caught up on the phenotypes, but at the end of the day, it's your genetics that tells most of the story, not the phenotype. You know what I'm saying? The phenotype is just your pigmentation. The genetics is what's more important. Okay, the genetic is really what tells it all. All right, so someone put uh, Mat Matilda, Matilda, Makir, and Cujo Lewis were brought over after the trade ended. They were Yoruba. Um, yes, I know about Cujo Lewis, but I don't know about Mat Mat Matilda. I don't know about Matilda. I really don't. So that's something I'll have to look into. But uh, yeah, I do know about the story of Cujo Lewis. Yeah. Let's see what else you guys are talking about in the comment section. I hope you guys are really enjoying yourself. Um, you know, brother and goes coming in with the bill and all of that. Let me see. Um, Kafir, it was also supposed to be a dissertation term, but it's a group of Africans in Surrey Yanka. Yeah, now I heard that the term Kafir was, you know, um, was also considered as offensive. You know what I'm saying? Like it was something that the Arabs used to describe black Africans. Yep. That's what I heard. So let's see. What else? Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. It says, we are the Novia Scotia Jews by the way of Kate Cole. You know what? It is a lot of it's a lot of blacks out there in Nova Scotia because when the black people left here in America, they went over to that region. They went into those areas. They really went over there to the area because that's where they went to. Um, you know, as far as that's where they went to settle at, you know, after, you know, the whole reconstruction era and some of them escaped up there to that area to get away from slavery. So, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of blacks migrated over there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure it's my business to do a video about no uh, blacks in uh, Scotia Novia, right? Or Novia Scotia, right? I, I want to do a video about that so that way we know that, you know, our ancestors, or what you call the Adolfs, they not just only here in America. They also in Canada. They also in Mexico. They also in Trinidad, Jamaica, uh in Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh <laughs> and all over. You know what I'm saying? You know, our ancestors, our ancestry is all over, even in Dominican Republican, when you look at the Somalian Republic, the Somali, the Somalian people or the, the Somalia people in uh Dominican Republic are the center of African Americans. You even had African Americans that went over there to Haiti. So, it, it, I mean, it's a lot that we we have to get into. We really have to get into, you know what I'm saying? But, but yeah, that's my uh, ancestry right there. And also, I can show you uh, my ancestry test as well while I'm on here. Okay, so let me uh show you guys my ancestry says. All right, so let me pull up my ancestry test. Let me sign in. Hold on, let me, let me, I'm trying to get on here, hold up. All 
All right, so let me uh, show you guys my ancestry. All right, so they updated my uh, ancestry on here. All right, so let me go ahead and show you guys my ancestry test. Mm, hold on. All right, so this is my ancestry test right here. All right, so this is ancestry test. And this is what is being discovered. So I got 36% Nigerian, Cameroon, Mali, uh, that's 11% Mali, 11% Benin and Togo, the Ivory Coast, 10%, Senegal, 4%, Nigerian, you know, um, so, uh, I have 2%, 3% European, uh, Germanic European, 2%, so that is... Let's see. I'm just I'm trying to calculate this. So all together, I have 92% African in me. So I have 92% of African in me. Okay. All right. So as you can see, it says Cameroon and Congo and Western Bantu people. All right. So it tells the story, it breaks things down. Okay. Okay, and then it breaks down my heritage. You know, parent number two, parent number one. All right, so my parent number one got Cameroon, Congo, and Western Bantu in them, right? They have a lot more of that. And then parent number two have a lot more Nigerian in them, okay? Okay, so you see... So this parent number two has 32%, right? All right, so you see that's my ancestry over here. So uh, they got 10%, parent number one got 10%, 10%. Uh, eight percent, seven percent, okay, and four percent. This has broken down, and three percent, all right. Whereas parent number two got thirty-two percent, so they had they got a high percentage of Nigerian, and then whereas parent number one has like an admixture of everything, but they have like ten percent of the Ivory Coast. And 10% of Benin and Togo missing them. All right. Okay. So just to go back. Just to go back. So this is my ancestry right here. This is from Ancestry Test. Okay. So it's updated on July uh, 2022. All right. But yeah, um, I just wanted to show y'all that. Um, so again, I hope you guys really enjoy yourselves uh, while I had this beautiful build with Brother Ngozi. Um, I really enjoyed that.
You know, he really always come in with great information. He come through breaking things down. So, and I have another book for you guys to look into that goes into the transatlantic slave trade uh, that deals with this subject matter, rather. Let me see some. Okay, so this book right here is called The Rise of the Transatlantic Slave Trade in Western Africa from 1300 to 1589. All right, so this is another book that I recommend you guys to get. Okay, to check out on your own terms. So, again, it's been, it's a lot. It's a lot to break down into when it comes to dealing with our ancestry and our history. It's really a whole lot. It really is. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, if anybody else want to say something, like if anybody want to come in, I will put the link in there for you guys. Y'all can come in and, um, you know, if you want to build or whatever, y'all can do that. So I got the link in the chat for y'all if y'all want to come in and say something real quick. You know, if y'all want to build or whatnot, um, I'll still be here. If anybody want to come through, if they want to say something, if anybody want to say something, that's the link in the chat. Okay, let me see if I can pin this up. I'm trying to see if I can. Yeah, so if you guys want to come in, then y'all can do that. You know, if y'all want to go ahead and build. If y'all want to go ahead and build. But yeah, you know, like I said, you know, all this is very important. Um, you know, information is needed and need, it needs to be said. You know, it's very important for us to really like know a lot about our ancestry and about, you know, where we come from as a people. We got to know these things. You know what I'm saying? We come from a rich culture. You know, we come from a unique people. We come from a very unique people. Um, yep. We do. We come from a very unique people. I mean, I don't know what other way to put it. You know, we had to take the initiative to want to just go out here and do the studies, go out here and do the work, go out here and do the research. We got to take the initiative. Yep. Cause can't nobody else do it for us but us you know what i'm saying it's up to us to really like do all of this you know but i strongly encourage people to study anthropology when people start studying anthropology they'll be able to understand more and there's plenty of books that you can find on anthropology you know what i'm saying you can go on amazon and look up information about it you can um go on google and look up anthropology it's so much stuff out there i mean to me i think it's one it's one of my favorite subject it's one of my favorite subjects to study it really is uh so if anybody want to come in and say something you know what I'm saying if y'all want to click on the link you can go ahead and do so come on in um you know this is the time now so y'all can you know give your thoughts and tell me what you think as far as uh the bill that i had with the brother just let me know what y'all think. So if y'all want to come on in, y'all can come on in here and build. I don't have no problem. So I uh I post the link in there for y'all. Mm -hmm. Time to clean up the mess. You're right. Time to clean up the mess. <laughs> yeah, it's time to clean up the mess. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, it was a powerful build. Ooh, let me charge my computer. It was a very, very, very powerful build. Very powerful. 
Hey, peace to Brother Chauncey. Shout out to Brother Chauncey. Thank you for coming through. Shout out to Lion Times Baby. Thank you for coming through. Shout out to uh, Jib. I think that's your name, Jib. Thank you for coming through. Uh, shout out to Is to the Street. Shout out to the brother. Thank you, HG, for coming through. I appreciate you a lot. I really appreciate this. Uh, shout out to Big, uh, Big Cree Money. If that's your name, Big Cree Money. Shout out to Sister Saja. All right. Go ahead. What's up, brother? How you doing? What's going on, Tiffany? How you doing? How you doing? I'm doing um, fine. Just... Awesome. Awesome. Now, I just wanted to uh, tap in with you. I'm driving right now. Uh, it was a, a very informative bill. Um, you know, tons of information, tons of information. Um, one thing that Ngozi said so far, like, you know, kind of breaking down these social um, barriers we got, like, you know, with the different classes and everything. Like, what are some things that, you know, we need to do to, like, get past those things? You know, the middle class, the, you know, when y'all was going back and forth with the, uh, you know, how Nigerians may feel this type of way or some may not feel this type of way against uh, black Americans, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, what are some things that we need to do, you know what I'm saying, in your opinion, that we can just you know what I'm saying, start to, you know, change that around, change that paradigm. One of the most important things that we need to do is study the history. We got to study history. We have to study about how, you know, as far as the economic system, study the history of slavery. And once we really get into the right direction of that, then we can be able to, you know, start putting our minds together and figure out, well, what can we do to break down the whole you know, what can we do to better ourselves? You know what I'm saying? We got to look at those who came before us, right? And what they have done and learn what we can do for, you know, what we can take from them and what we should not take from them as far as their mistakes is concerned, okay? So that's the most important thing. We got to study the history. We got to study the system that we in and we must understand the system and we must acknowledge that, all right? So, but if you don't study your history, if you don't study the political structure of this system, then you're not going to be able to come up with a practical solution. Mm, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, one of the things that you touched on, and we kind of touched on it when you we, when you was on my platform, is you know, is capitalism. And you know, I'd be thinking that what you said is exactly what I'd be thinking. How can you be black and you actually support capitalism? Is that just like, you know, people have given up, you know, the the fight or, you know, whatever the fight may be, you know, um, you know, I know what my fight is and, you know, other people may have, you know, their individual fights. You know, I don't know how they're fighting or what they're fighting. But when I run into black people who actually support capitalism and can't see past capitalism, like they can't envision a world without a, a, a capitalistic, you know, system. You know, like, what do we do for those people, you know, or 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 am I delusional to think that um, there could be a different system that's a little bit. I don't know if you ever heard of the Venus Project. You have heard of the Venus Project because if, um, I know it was mentioned during the Zeitgeist, one of those videos, right? Yeah, the Zeitgeist video, yeah. Right, 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 right. So, I mean... These people who, these black people who believe in capitalism, you know, like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, to me, it's just like, it's like, it's insane. But, you know, I just want to know what you think about it. Uh, it's pretty bizarre. It's pretty bizarre because what they focusing on is the concept of individualism. Because there's no way you could think capitalism will benefit everybody. Because if that was the case, then there would be no concept of upper class, lower class, and middle class right then everybody would be able to get generational wealth there wouldn't be no concept of um institutional racism taking place you know what i'm saying so and not saying that any other economic system don't have a problem in it but capitalism is the main factor of all of that regardless whatever economic system somebody else is in whether it's communism or socialism capitalism is going to play a major part in that because it's a global thing you know what i'm saying so and so if you don't, so if you think that capitalism is beneficial for us, then 
why do we still have these different type of system? Why we have so many classes? And regardless of who you vote into office, whether they be Democrat or Republican, right? It does mm -hmm. not change the circumstances that's really taking place. There's still going to always be those class system. So it's good that you have politician in there, but at the same time, you know what I'm saying? In order for these things to like be taken care of, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Someone has to eradicate the whole concept of capitalism. And mm -hmm. it has to be eradicated. It has to be, it has to change. It has to be uh, done away with. You know what I'm saying? But, mm -hmm. you know, again, who's going to put up that type of fight? Okay, who's going to put up okay. that type of fight to get rid of the economic system? Well, um, I, I have to be honest. That's 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 part of my fight. That's part of my fight. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a big system. It's been going on for thousands of years. You know, I'm just one person, but I can honestly say that is on the top three of my agenda. Um, you know, hey, it is what it is. You know, um, all I can say is, um, you know, I'm ready to get to work. Um, I, I look forward to uh, continuing to build with you. It was a, a beautiful build with you and uh, Ngozi. Um, and just keep doing your thing, sister. All right, Dan. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming through. Thank you for coming through. All right, peace. All right, peace. All right. Uh, anybody else that want to come in? They want to chime in real fast? Anybody else that want to chime in? Anybody else? All right, then. But, um, but other than that, uh, let's see. What time is it now? So it's almost 6 o'clock on my time. All right. Um, yeah, I just want to say this. I really want to say this. You know, it's always good to have an inquisitive mind, an inquiry mind at that. It's always good to have that. It's always good to be eager to learn something. It is it's always good, you know. Uh, because you can go a long way with it. Now, you can't do everything by yourself, but whatever information that is valuable in a substance, you can pass it down to the next generation that's going to come. And then that generation can pass it down to the next generation. And then that next generation can come down to that next generation. You know what I'm saying? So, it's up to us to make sure that we pass down the information that is needed. You know what I'm saying? That we give the information to people. So, it's a lot of stuff that needs to be discovered. No matter what the subject is, it's a lot of things that have to be discovered. There's a lot of things that's out there. But it takes the person who's willing to learn. There's a saying goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. When the student is ready, the teacher will disappear. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Again. The proverb goes like this. When a uh, student is ready, the teacher will appear. When a student is ready, the teacher will disappear. So that means when the person is ready to learn, then they'll be able to learn from those who are able to teach or they'll be able to, yeah, they'll be able to acquire that out. And when that person is ready to learn on their own, and learn more and discover more, then that teacher will disappear. They'll be able to branch out in experience on their own. You know? So, with that being said, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. 
build once again thank you guys that tune in watching and thank you all that has been supporting my channel make sure you like and subscribe to my channel hit the notification bell share my channel and all that great stuff and shout out to my new subscribers that's coming through thank y'all so much for coming in thank you to the people in the chat that brought about the commentary thank y'all so much i really appreciate it uh it, that really means a lot. I really thank y'all for dialoguing and having a conversation here. So I hope you all have a good one. And I hope you all be safe. And um, be careful. All right. So until next time, may peace and power elevation be to all of you. And it's your girl Tiffany. And I'm logging out saying deuces. And uh, make sure y'all just uh, play it safe out here. All right. And be careful. And make sure you pass the knowledge on down to the next generation. And to your peers, to your friends, y'all have a dialogue, y'all have a discussion. You know what I'm saying? Just help those around you who are willing to learn because everybody is not willing to receive information. So help those who are willing to receive and willing to learn and willing to take in the knowledge. Okay? So with that being said, y'all have a good one. Y'all be safe and peace. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Thank you.